Abby, my friend, Dr. Abby Phillips, the liver doctor of the internet, uh, the man who has put in all two hands with fight against alternative forms of medicine. Absolutely a thrill to have you on Lights Cameras, Abby. Thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to our uh, long session. I've just kept the whole day for this now, the morning part. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. This is absolutely that's absolutely great to uh, have you on the show. I've been following your work very closely. By when I say work, I mean tweets, uh, not your research papers, unfortunately, which I definitely intend to read anytime soon. Uh, Abby, you are you are at an intersection of uh, you know science plus you know you know you're practicing medicine as well. Uh, so, what should we call you? Are you a scientist? Are you a doctor? Uh, you also, I think, run your own setup in Kerala. So if you could explain a little bit more professionally what you do, uh, apart from day-to-day -day diagnosing patients, that would be great. Yes, so um, I, I'm, I'm basically a clinician. I'm a physician. Um, I'm a, a specialist in managing uh, liver disease patients. So that is hepatology. And uh, at the core, I'm a, I practice every day. I mean, I'm a... I have an OPD and I have I take I take care of patients in the IP. So that's my primary uh, profession and my uh, passion. So I'm a clinician at heart. But apart from being just a clinician with a nine to five job, I do a little more for my patients. So that is when that is where the importance of clinical research also comes in. So I have a separate unit where I um, and I look at a lot of um, patient data, analyze them retrospectively, run studies prospectively, and then uh, do clinical research on the sites. So the important aspect to note here is that there is a dying breed of uh, physicians that we have uh, currently. So, I mean, when you say a doctor, a doctor is somebody who sees patients every day, takes care of them in the OPD, and then sees them in the IPD, uh, you know, uh, cares for them, prescribes medicines. That is, that is what uh, a doctor comes across as. But there is there are a group of doctors who are actually researchers also, where they apply a lot of uh, basic science work, work on basic science aspects of healthcare, um, trying to do new things for patients, you know, trying to break dogmas, questioning guidelines, bringing forward uh, novel aspects in healthcare for people. So they are called, they are known as physician scientists or clinical scientists. So I would consider I would like to place myself in that. Because I don't, uh, you know, close myself as uh, somebody who just goes to the hospital and comes back home and then goes back to the hospital again. And that's a nine to five job. No, I, I, do, I want to do more than that for my patients. So that, that is where I come across as a physician scientist. Uh, in India, we don't have a course to actually say that, you know, people can become physician scientists. A lot of them become uh, clinical scientists on their own because of their uh, interest or passion in it. But in the U.S., there are courses where we can actually have, uh, where they actually train people to doctors to become clinician scientists. So you have a, a MD PhD course where you can do clinical work as well as get trained in aspects of, uh, you know, uh, clinical research also. But in India, uh, doctors themselves decide that they want to do that and become uh, clinical scientists. So that that is where I am. Um, I have coming to the question of uh, about my setup here in Kerala. So we have a, a super specialty consultancy group, uh, which is started by my, my father. He's a very senior gastroenterologist. And uh, he uh, has been practicing since more than four decades. And uh, he has built this uh, unit from scratch since last five, six years. We've been, uh, I mean, I, I was, I'm part of this unit where we offer specialized services to tertiary level hospitals with respect to gastroenterology, hepatology, and transplant medicine. So currently we are situated at Rajagiri Hospital uh, at Kochi, and uh, we've been there since the last uh, two years. Wow, uh, you have spoken a lot of times, Abby, about the impact your father had on your life uh, and the way your thinking is. Uh, and uh, would love to know a little bit about that relationship and his impact on your life, uh, and not just from a science standpoint, but also uh, the impact that he had, uh, you know, as a father, probably, you know encouraging you to go very deep in your field, go beyond the traditional way a uh, growth path of a doctor is. And how does did your family support system probably help you become what you are today? 
So I, I think a large part of what I do now or I what I decided to do now, uh, I mean, wholly rests on what my dad has decided for me, you know, because his decisions mattered at the right time uh, during various, uh, you know, a fork in the roads where I was stuck at, you know, whether it was, you know, uh, choosing a college for MBBS or joining a specialty in uh, MD course or super specializing. I mean, he was there all the time. Yeah, and uh, the the best part was that I mean I I would say I, I would say that the most important part part was that uh, we were always a scientifically thinking progressive family, you know I we have, I've I've never had to uh, be exposed to any sort of uh, pseudo scientific or or traditional culture based practices in healthcare, except the fact that I was given a lot of chavan prash when I was a kid. <laughs> that that apart, that apart, yeah. I mean, I I think every kid in India gets that. So that yeah. apart, I mean, there was, I mean, when it comes to decisions, it was all core uh, decisions based on proper uh, logic and rationale. So my family plays a lot of part in it. So my brother, he's he's a uh, he's the eldest. Uh, he's a computer engineer now. He's uh, into marketing and uh, he's a systems analyst and uh, he's based in the US. My elder sister, uh, she's an artist. She's a minimalistic artist, and she runs her own, um, uh, you know, art studio in the U.S. And my younger sister, she is actually a musician. So now she is completing a PhD in musicology, and uh, she is based in Europe. So you can see how everybody is doing so many different things. I mean, it's not like uh, okay, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a doctor, you're an engineer. So my my dad at that time thought of sending. Uh, you know, me and my siblings to uh, places or into professions where we were comfortable in. So initially, what I wanted to do was uh, media and theater because I love screenwriting. So that is that was my first passion. So every time I, I uh, completed a grade, uh, eighth, ninth, tenth, I would I would dream that you know at some I'll get into theater, I'll start screenplay, I want to be a writer and things like that. But ultimately, when reality hit me, I think my dad and my mom they saw that you know. Uh, I had something in me that was driving me towards uh, medical field, even though at that time uh, standard was medicine or engineering. My brother obviously did engineering, and then I was the guy left with uh, the doctor part because my dad is a doctor. Somebody has to take the baton, and uh, I was initially not interested. But when I started looking at how he was working and the kind of work that he was doing, and that kind of work is not visible now. I mean, if you ask me. In our day-to-day -day practice now, I don't see the work that he was doing about 20, 25 years back, because that was pure clinical medicine. It was the art of clinical medicine, where you have compassion, empathy. He is still available on phone 24 hours for his patients. I don't think. Uh, I mean, I can't. I can't handle that now. It's too much for me to handle patients on the phone all the time because they keep calling you, and you have to be patient with them. You have to. Uh, you have to be cool at every level you know i mean you work from morning till evening like a dog you are so tired and then you again have to talk to patients regarding whatever uh, i mean it might be a silly matter but for them it's a big matter so but then you have to keep that cool so i mean my dad still does that and he's been doing that for four decades so that kind of uh, doctor to patient relationship is almost invisible now and when i saw that it's not about uh you know becoming successful in career but it's it's about doing your bit for whoever you can and medicine is such a field where you are put in a position every day where you can actually help people you know it's it's not like you have a choice i mean you don't need to you just have to think straight and then start working and that's automatically helping people and medicine is such a such a fantastic uh, profession to do that because you get that opportunity every single day uh, this a whole aspect of uh, you know humanism uh, actually came from my exposure to how my dad dealt with his patients and how my mother used to actually uh, talk to patients for example my dad had a small uh, consultation uh, clinic at home so he used to see patients very early in the morning he'll wake up at like 4 a.m and start seeing patients at 5 and by 9 he's at in the hospital seeing patients again for the hospital opd and my, uh, and we used to get calls late night at 10, 10, 30, 11, uh, asking for appointments or asking for directions to the home. And I mean, I would, I would just tell the, I mean, at that time, I would just tell them, don't ask an auto rickshaw guy or you know, ask a bus, the somebody in the railway station. They'll, they'll guide you. 
but my mom at 10 30 11 in the night i can see her giving pristine instructions i mean that would take about 10 to 15 minutes of clear cut instructions how to get home what to do when you come here and that that would happen even at night at 11 30 you know so there was a lot of caring happening there and it was not like they consider this as uh you know something that they need to do and finish off no it was not like that it was all about caring so the whole aspect of humanism which actually drives uh you know our medical field or practice that is what uh, helped me choose this career and i think my parents and family played a very big role in it and very interesting thing you mentioned about your uh, uh, mom and generally your dad also and uh, i as a society and specifically in your profession Abhi, where do you think uh, this compassion has lost now well, I think uh, life has become much more complicated now, now that we are digitized and uh, we have a lot of information to assimilate. I mean, when I was a kid, I had just two things to do, you know, go to school, come back and play. And uh, dad had his work, where, which he loved. And uh, my mother had her uh, work at home with us and with dad. The life was so simple, but now it's 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 become cutthroat you know in, in any field i mean you take it take medicine per se uh, when, when my dad started he, during his time he was the first gastroenterologist who used to do interventional endoscopies and everything i mean he was he has a lot of firsts to its name uh, ercp uh, glue injection for uh, bleeding varices for liver disease patients all of that he's done first in india so at that time he was the real specialist and uh, it was not it was okay it was easy for him to move forward with that but now look at Look at the scenario now. So many doctors are passing out. So many gastroenterologists are passing out. You 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 can actually have uh, skilled people in many many hospitals in a in a single city, and uh, it all amounts to the number of patients that you have to see, and uh, that is the yardstick now. So a doctor sees hundred patients versus a doctor seeing ten patients. The doctor seeing hundred patients is a better doctor or a more successful doctor according to what people will think. So doctors are now just going in and, you know, just pushing their work to uh, make sure that they do more work. It may not be good quality, uh, but just quantity. So I think with that kind of an attitude, a lot of this compassion and actual medical care, clinical care has uh, run out of uh, in, in current practice and with the rise of corporates. So any country that you look at, uh, the public health, I mean, the, the specialized healthcare is all uh, provided by the public health universities and hospitals. But look at India. All the major super specialized aspects of uh, advanced uh, medical care is provided by the private sector. So if somebody wants to do a liver transplant in Kerala, they'll have to go do it in a private hospital. The government hospitals don't do it. The state government hospitals don't do it. They do it once in a while, but they have no consistent programs. They have no consistent uh, uh, teams that can do that for the people. So it all amounts to the private uh, corporates handling the large uh, quality of work or quantity of work, which, which requires specialization. And this has put more pressure on doctors uh, on targets. So when I started working initially, I, I was in a corporate setup. I have now out of corporate setup because now we have our own consultancy group and we can decide what, what we should do. Even though we work in a corporate hospital, they don't... Uh, pay a salary and they don't decide what we should be doing. We do that. So I'm out of corporate sector. So when I used to work in a corporate sector, it was terrible. I mean, it was just about the number of patients outside your door and uh, the number of people that you can admit and do perform tests and perform uh, specialized uh, treatments or perform endoscopies and things like that. The more the number, the, the better the doctor you are for that hospital. You know, so this, this kind of an attitude where uh, you have to push yourself to show uh, the kind of work that you do through quantification instead of qualitative work is what has led to a very bad dip, I mean, very low dip in the compassionate care that we so much yearn to get from doctors these days. Absolutely. And uh, what do you think, Abhi, of uh, uh, this idea that hospitals should be or healthcare should be state led or uh, there should be maybe you know more public hospitals should be there uh, versus the privatization of healthcare obviously which has happened in the massively in the last 30 years since liberalization that is one area but uh, also 
we at the at, at one end i mean i am in north india and i know i can tell you our public hospitals are nowhere close to your public hospitals in south uh, they are they are even the basic ones are very terrible uh, so how how do we how do you think is there a way out of this equation uh, from from a large macro standpoint yeah um i mean uh, see in india has uh, i mean if you ask me india has good money good funds to push into healthcare it has and uh, there is i don't think there is a problem with uh, having low funds to drive more into the public health uh, you know uh, areas the problem is that people choose not to so i am not sure why this is happening i mean i'm sure there are multiple reasons for it but uh, when i look at uh doctors who work in the public sector versus doctors who work in the private sector here i see that the private sector provides a lot more for doctors to work on but that does not happen to doctors working in the public sector so i i think at some point the public sector is happy or people working in the public sector are happy with mediocrity you know they are happy that they are that that level of mediocrity that they are they call it as standard so that is the call that is the maximum quality that they can offer and they are happy with that mediocrity but if you ask me when i am working in the private sector the first hospital that i was at um i i do a lot of specialized treatments so when i said that you know i need a i need to do some uh, additional work for my patients treatments for my patients in the form of stool transplantation so, so that is something the, that uniquely that my department does here uh i mean if you look at uh, globally that is what my unit does that only for alcoholic liver disease patients stool transplant so the initial uh, hospital they were not very keen on starting a stool transplant lab and giving me you know uh, provisions to start off the, a, a good stool transplant program so i was very unsatisfied with my work because even though my work from a patient point of view was going on very well that additional work i was not able to do and which i was having a very poor work satisfaction so i moved on moved on to another hospital where they provided me all of that now this next step to that was to actually look at basic science work in stool transplant study the gut microbiome study the gut bacteria see what is happening at the molecular level cellular level so that kind of work i wanted to do and that hospital could not provide me or i could not set it up there because of infrastructure issues so i left that place and now i am in this place where everything is provided for me because uh we take care of the decisions about infrastructures and what all we can do and i'm happy here so that kind of a growth is not seen in public uh, health systems for example all indian institute of medical sciences pga chandigarh they should be doing the largest numbers of liver transplantation in this country but that is not happening uh, private hospitals in delhi uh, and maharashtra and uh, uh, punjab are doing very large numbers of liver transplantation so i'm not sure why the public health uh, infrastructure cannot be upgraded to an extent that they can take over a lot of work from the private sector and that actually reduces uh, resource burden on the patients when if public sectors take up a lot of work uh, which specialized work that the private sector is doing patients are going to benefit so i i, I don't know uh, where to pinpoint the exact problem as i mean i think there is a lot of problems here from allocation issues to corruption to uh, you know people being comfortable in the mediocrity position that they are in uh, like for example when the covid struck for two years no, no i mean i was i could not travel no, nobody could travel anywhere and i was happy sitting home and finally when it all settled down and uh, people started calling me for talks and attending conferences and giving lectures out of kerala i was not at all ready to do that i was happy at home so I, i initially i said that i am not going to come for this meeting i am not going to come for that meeting i was happy with that mediocre comfortable work that i was doing home so i think this this problem with uh, apathy towards improvement in healthcare which first should be patient first i mean the whole aspect of public healthcare for the government should be citizen first that aspect is lacking because of which anything to promote public health or anything to promote or uh, you know make superior uh caring aspects in uh, medical care at a public level that is completely lacking in uh, from the government side and i hope it changes in the future because you, you see uh, scientifically progressive and developed countries uh, the whole medical care uh, is taken over by the public health system and also because we don't have a centralized insurance system here uh, where we can give equal uh, 
quality of work, I mean, treatments to everybody at every level that they deserve, even that is lacking. So I think that is the reason why we have a lot of issues at public health versus uh, privatization of health in this country. I mean, these are just my opinions, but I'm sure there is much more to it. No, yeah, I'm sure. And this is a never ending debate, Abby, honestly. I mean, I have had this question on this podcast every time somebody related to even health has, uh, has come up. And, you know, everybody has uh, more or less this opinion where they say that, yes, we believe in public health, uh, but somehow we have put it on its progress on the back burner and we have allowed the private players to take care of it. And uh, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's a very similar argument that people have. Um, with, with the privatization of the larger economy, people thought that, you know, public sector units are, you know, they're not that great. Let's just privatize it and let the private players in, get efficiency and innovation in the system. Uh, and exactly. uh, they thought that the, they thought the same would happen in healthcare, which I think did happen. But it, I mean, it has its own limitations and restrictions. Uh, first of all, I mean, from very basic restriction, like access to that private healthcare, which is, which itself comes, I mean, I mean, who can access it? Who can afford it? I mean, uh, yes. we, we recently paid a bill of lakhs when my grandfather was admitted to the hospital. And uh, not sure if anybody can do that. Any other player, people can do that as well. So, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I have had patients who have come to me for uh, advanced care, referred from other uh, peripheral hospitals. And uh, ultimately, most of them need liver transplant to survive. That is the only one. That is the only actual intervention that can increase survival in advanced liver failure patients. And uh, they come here, and they are completely, you know, taken aback by the cost of treatments. I mean, it's not just this hospital. Every hospital that you take at the private level, if they want good quality care, uh, people have to spend because the hospital has to has already spent a lot of resources in putting that particular treatment options in place. And uh, what I do is that I counsel them regarding the whole aspect of, you know, spending so much on healthcare, especially if the healthcare part is, I mean, the, the intervention is very beneficial, they need to spend because that, that that's not, it's not a waste of money. That, that money is going to uh, be benefic- beneficial for them, spending that money. But a lot of them don't have that kind of money to spend. So ultimately what they do is they take the patient either back home because they can't even afford a ward room and the patient dies at home. I mean, absolutely no uh, spend expenditure there. You know, patient dies at home. Or what they do is they take the patient to a nearby clinic where they put him on basic support. For example, you know, some IV drips for hydration, maybe some tube feedings, no actual medications, uh, some medicines for uh, symptom care, for example, for pain or for nausea, vomiting, things like that, which, which will cost them nothing, uh, actually. It's very, very less expenditure from the family side. But uh, eventually the patient dies. But if we had a system where they could afford that, these patients all would be surviving even now. You know, they are dying because they can't afford healthcare. And I think this is a big problem uh, in India. And I'm sure there are a lot of other countries also having this problem. But I think we owe our patients, I mean, the government, the the, the public system own, owes the patient, the, at least the sick, uh, the right to health. It's very important. I mean, there is, is if there is one major right that people should have, I think it's the right to health. I mean, every, we are all humans and uh, we need to take care of each other. And it, it should not be like, okay, this human is at this level, so he can afford that. And this human is at this level, so he can only afford this much. So you go die at home and you be uh, well in the ICU here. I mean, that's just, it's, it's very painful to see that. And uh, that is one uh, reason why I stopped working at uh, corporate sectors and started working in my own sector where uh, we can offer people a lot of um, you know uh, uh, something like uh, we give them uh, options to I mean we can we can we can make decisions for the amount of money they need to spend so a lot of people can afford a lot of treatments that we offer at our units because of that decision that we make for them but we can't go on doing that because it's it's going to cost us also at some point and uh, there is no buffer system here and uh, I, I but i hope that what we do now can be taken up in the future also and more and more hospitals do this and that can come with good private public partnerships so the governments can actually help the private sector to improve on uh, the care that we give or affordability that patients can uh, do do with 
you know that has to do with medical insurance etc i mean lot of things to talk about on that point of view but ultimately this is what it is and uh, i i hope it becomes better uh, once we go step into the future of healthcare in india absolutely and, and while you were speaking abhi one thought came uh, came across let's say my biggest concern let's say if i am asked for a liver transplant uh, or somebody in my family has been asked for a liver transplant uh, it was very difficult at least in the private setup to trust the diagnosis or the doctor who has recommended transplant because as a patient i mean i don't know uh, you know whether genuinely is the transplant required or is it just a money making scheme and i'm sure these these are the kind of doubts that a lot of patients have as well uh, what what are your thoughts on that this is very true because um, see patients themselves sometimes get the intuition that they need to take a second opinion it's not the doctor that sends the patient to a specialist or a some or, or or another doctor for a second opinion it's the patients themselves or the families or a, or a relative of the patient who feels that you know we have to uh, talk to some other doctor regarding this so i i get a lot of patients who have been offered a liver transplant elsewhere and who come to me and i see that they don't require transplants at all you know they can go on without a transplant for about 6 years very uh, comfortably uh, uh, you know save money or funds for a transplant in the future when they actually require it so now pushing them into a transplant they are they are running helter skelter for funds looking for donors and things like that but they do not need to do that in the first place so i i get a lot of patients where i have told them or i have taken them out of the transplant listing and uh, put them on good medical care and they are still doing so well uh, why do uh, doctors or uh, hospitals or institutions do that because uh, a lot of these hospitals and institutions they are over they have uh, over invested in uh, in their infrastructures so they need to break even and uh, this is the way they do that because ultimately uh, healthcare has become a business now it's not not no more about the art of patient care it's it's now become the business of healthcare and uh, a lot of these private hospitals struggle to stay afloat and this is what they have to do a lot of investigations a lot of prescriptions i mean forget surgeries even a simple thing as prescription is just financial burden to a lot of patients what i do uh, on a daily basis is to deprescribe i mean that is my 70% job every day from 9 to 5 is to deprescribe so a lot of patients who come to me or get referred to me for their um, illnesses and their treatment uh, reviews uh, i see that some of them are on 20 22 pills also in a day and I, i i look at them and i look at the reports and i see that they just require two just two pills a day and they are on 23 so i cut out the 21 pills so that that those 23 pills actually brings in money for the hospital and for the doctor because a lot of hospitals cannot afford doctors now as full time employees for example there was a time when uh i could just be an employee in a hospital and they would pay me a salary and they would hike up my salary maybe every year as a, as part as a, you know 5% or 10% or whatever and I, everybody would be comfortable but hosp- hospitals can't do that now they can't afford uh, uh doctors and they can't pay them a lot of money and keep them so what they do is they tell the doctors that the more you generate the more you'll generate for us the more you'll generate for yourself so what what they do is they do cutbacks and this is happen this happens i think this is an open secret uh, doctors do get cutbacks on their prescriptions and on the tests that they prescribe on the procedures that they do that is how hospitals keep uh, doctors these days and the more they do that the more they can earn so that is why this culture of over investigation over prescriptions and unnecessary advices on surgical management like exactly you said about uh, doing a transplant for somebody who does not require a transplant you know, comes into picture and i am not sure what the solution is for this kind of a uh, uh, behavior from the healthcare community but this deeply uh, you know it it uh, insults the core of actual uh, clinical practice and also deeply damages uh, the the profession so I, i'm not saying that every doctor is doing it so if there are 100 doctors there might be 5 who does this stuff and 95 will be practicing as per principles they will be doing and following things they have been taught and what they feel are mo- feel is moral and ethical but what what comes into the open and what we see in social media and uh, the information that floats around will be only on those five 
who are doing uh, unethical work and that that becomes generalized to the whole doctor community so even that we have to curb and then it becomes uh, a pretty picture all over correct no uh, me and some of my colleagues have a solution around it i would love to talk to you about it after this uh, session is over uh sure oh, great yeah okay yeah uh, anyway so coming back uh, to the point abhi can you uh, throw some light on some latest research that you have been you have picked up and some findings that you are you know you are willing to share uh, and then maybe we'll slowly dive deep into uh, the topic of the day okay so um, recently we have had uh, three really good papers out in the last 3 to 4 months uh one paper was recently ac- accepted about a, a a week back so i'll i maybe i can talk about that first so that that study is on um alcohol use disorder so the whole uh, term that we call alcoholic is now out of the window because it is very stigmatizing so we call us alcohol yeah. use disorder person with alcohol use disorder so uh, what we did was we looked at people who were binge drinking versus people who were drinking daily and they developed liver disease in the form of a very severe condition known as alcoholic hepatitis so there is now known as alcohol associated hepatitis which is when so much of uh, large amounts of alcohol goes into the liver it uh, causes sudden swelling of the liver cells and liver cell damage resulting in jaundice and fluid accumulation in the in the abdomen and a lot of complications of cirrhosis uh, of liver disease which can lead to liver failure and even death in the short term so when we looked at people who were drinking uh, you know binge drinking uh, which is like uh, more than four drinks in two hours time in a very short period versus people who were drinking daily you know few uh, three to four drinks a day continuously we found out that the bacteria in the gut in the intestine of these two groups of patients were very different so binge drinkers had a different kind of bacterial profile in the intestine and daily drinkers had a very different kind of bacterial profile in the intestine and some of the bacterial profiles for example specific bacteria we have identified the species also some of these specific species were associated with specific complications in them so some of them will have very high jaundice because of a particular bacteria because of the higher presence of a particular bacteria in their intestine and some of them will have uh, a protective for example they become better because of some bacteria in their intestine so we we did this uh, and this is probably the first study to do that where we identified specific bacterial groups uh, driving drinking patterns in in humans and uh, leading to specific clinical outcomes in these group of patients so this gives us an opportunity to modulate these bacteria you know in the future to reduce different patterns of drinking uh, in people so it's it's now the cha- the changing the whole bacterial population through either stool transplantation or using other bacterial population in the form of capsules or powders or whatever you know the probiotics and all that uh, that actually becomes uh, uh, you know maybe it could become part of de addiction programs in the future and de addiction does not mean only psychiatric and antipsychotic drugs something like this can be part of it which is safer and uh, maybe we can somebody finds out that it is more effective also so that was one paper that we published uh, recently accepted and the other two were uh, really uh, bombshell publications where we are getting a lot of feedback on it uh, one was published in this journal called medicine uh, which is a peer reviewed high impact journal uh, i mean it, it's been there since century it's a very old journal uh, we published on how uh, the governments Uh, choice of ayush related integrative care in immune boosting in uh, people to prevent covid actually did to people who had underlying liver disease so there was this whole aspect of integrating ayush practices in prevention and treatment of covid and uh, when that particular practice was taken up by a group of uh, liver disease patients for example they had underlying or pre existing liver disease what happened to them so we published this data which showed that more than 40% of these patients developed i mean more than 65% of these patients developed severe liver injury because of those practices for example herbal liver toxicity heavy metal toxicity and other things uh, and about 40% of them who developed severe liver injury with an on an underlying pre existing liver disease 
died without a transplant just because they chose to immune boost with Ayush. So those Ayush immune boosting practices directly leading to liver disease or liver injury and death was proven uh, in this particular study. So this study is uh, published just about a few months back. And uh, we have been getting a lot of patients who've been on these immune boosting practices, taking all these untested, uh, invalidated uh, therapies uh, and landing up in trouble. So the whole aspect, the whole point of a message of that study was that, you know, if that, if that kind of a promotion was never there, these people would be alive even now. The families would not have lost them. So that is the core message. So this was one. And the last paper was uh, the first paper in the world, which is also the largest series uh, on homeopathy related liver injury. So when if somebody hears this for the first time, they'll just say it's some kind of wild imagination because homeopathy can never injure anybody because it's no effect side, no side effect kind of a kind of a profile that it has been enjoying all this way. So suddenly the study comes and says, you know, homeopathy can injure you. It can harm your liver and then you can die from it. So what's happening here? So that was a very confusing yet very interesting paper that we published in uh, this journal called Hepatology Communications, which is the official journal of the American Association of Study of Liver Diseases. Very good journal, high impact journal. So what we showed was that uh, traditionally prepared classical homeopathic formulations. For example, if you follow the real homeopathic rules and principles and prepare uh, a particular remedy, uh, that would just be a very uh, dilute uh, formulation with either, uh, you know, uh, milk sugar, that is lactose, or it will be alcohol because some of them die or normal saline or uh, some of them even dilute in alcohol. But the, you will not have any active component in it. And that, that is obviously not going to harm anybody. But the fact is that a lot of homeopaths themselves and a lot of uh, homeopathy companies, they prepare these proprietary formulations and homeopaths prepare or uh, prescribe a lot of uh, uh, starting compound. No, it's not the ultra diluted formulations that they prescribe. They prescribe starting compounds known as mother tinctures for the patients, to the patients, because they know that the ultra diluted formulations will do nothing for those uh, patients because they are just like water or highly diluted forms of alcohol. So what they do is they actually prescribe the mother tincture formulations, which are the starting compound containing the active component. And that has actually harmed these patients. So a lot of patients who are on these mother compounds or mother tinctures home, from homeopathy uh, practitioners develop severe liver injury, leading to death uh, in, a, in a lot of people that we have uh, published on. Uh, second is a lot of formulations were adulterated and a lot of formulations were contaminated. So direct toxicity because of the active mother compound, uh, indirect toxicity because of contaminants and adulterants led to liver injury in people who are consuming homeopathy. So the whole myth of homeopathy, no effect, no side effect uh, is now out of the window. Homeopathy can also harm you. So these were the three uh, major studies that we recently published on. <laughs> oh, for, these are so concerning, Abby. And for which one you got uh, the most flack? The homeopathy one, obviously, because we have a cult here. Uh, Kerala, I think uh, after uh, Germany and France, uh, and probably I think West Bengal also is there, uh, where homeopathy is followed so religiously. You know, it's like a religion for a lot of people here. Uh, that's Kerala and West Bengal, you know, after Germany and France. I mean, Germany is the obviously the starting point of homeopathy, and France is where Samuel Hahnemann died. The, the inventor of homeopathy and it has a lot of homeopathy for a lot of major companies i mean manufacturers from homeopathy are from france and uh, because we published this and uh, showed that even homeopathy can harm uh, the homeopathy practitioners did not keep quiet so uh, we've had a lot of flack on social media personally also a lot of threats and harassment and abuses which i ignore now because i i know that doesn't make any any sense anymore uh, giving legal letters, complaint letters from authorities and things like that. It's all happening because of this particular study. Uh, but then yeah. we also have very good scientific critique, uh, critique from the homeopathy community on our study where they actually send letters to the editor of the journal, which I'm sure will be published very soon because they criti criticized our study and the journal asked us to give a rebuttal to those criticisms. And two such really nice uh, letters have been chosen and we have given the rebuttal to those and that will be very published very soon on the journal website. I think everybody should read it. It's very, 
it's beautiful i mean uh, the the criticism from the homeopaths and how we gave the rebuttal it's it's a good teaching in uh, science communication and uh, these criticism do you consider them to be you know logically sound uh, scientifically thoughtful or were they were they just attacks oh from the homeopaths absolutely not they were not at all logically sound there's nothing science in it but it's it's a lot of argument from uh, logically fallacious uh, you know uh, understanding so for example um, one person would say that uh, his argument is this you know uh, everybody even you have been saying that homeopathy is actually uh, useless because it is just water and dilute diluted stuff and now you are saying that it is causing harm uh, how is that it does not fit with your narrative so the whole idea is that the the paper itself says that why these were harmful it because of adulterants contaminations use of active compounds and things like that i mean they have not even read the paper properly and they are just shooting arguments like this another person would say that uh, you know uh, mother tinctures are the least potent i mean according to homeopaths the principles is that the more you dilute it the stronger it gets and the lesser it is diluted the weaker it is so that is the homeopathy principle that drives their practice that is what even samuel hanneman said he said that if you take uh, a very strong compound and dilute the life out of it it becomes a very strong compound which is absolute nonsense so these guys say that uh, you know we never prescribe mother tinctures it is not part of homeopathy principles it it it, it cannot be so your whole uh, data and whatever you've shown is actually fake but i have prescriptions from homeopaths themselves on these of the from these patients where they have mentioned take mother tincture two drops or three drops 16 to 17 times a day and all that so even that is there so they themselves are ignorant about the kind of uh, malpractices running in their own among their own practitioners so such kinds of arguments so there is nothing scientific in it for us to prove but then we'll have to deal with these kind of logically fallacious arguments and that whole paper and the 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 letter and the reply to the letter is full of such um, very interesting you know, arguments and the reply so it's I, i think a common man will find it very amusing to read so uh, so i have now well, i have tons of questions around homeopathy now that you have touched this topic uh, so tell me this abhi first of all uh, how and when did homeopathy developed why did it developed and i mean till couple of years ago i actually thought them as sugar pills but now after reading about from you and your research i mean i am more concerned now uh, and what is the world governments doing i mean how are they allowing this alternative form of medicine to not just they be there but prevail that's one second of all uh, i mean I, i i could understand that you know the eastern part of the world has been known for alternative forms of medicine with whether it is chinese herbs or uh, old chinese medicines or india ayurveda etc but when i see western world which has sort of sort of always championed scientific temper rationality etc etc uh, and when i see when you, you use names like germany and france uh, i mean this is this is quite a uh, shocking and surprising maybe this is my colonial mindset speaking i don't know that but you can tell me better this is this is a big rabbit hole yeah i mean so uh, a lot to unpack here about homeopathy i think we can have a five or six hour podcast on it because <laughs> it's that much of an yeah. interesting subject uh, i mean just to break it down uh, very simply um, the homeopathy was uh, invented at a time when we did not have a light bulb so it is it's it's about 200 to 220 230 years old so when we did not have a light bulb it was a time when homeopathy was invented so you can imagine at that time uh, we did not have much understanding about the human body the physiology uh, we did not under, we have we never had an actual scientific method at that time so uh, a lot of doctors at the physicians during the time used to treat patients with crude methods for example they used to believe that if patients were made to vomit uh, a lot of bad stuff from the body comes out and then they get better so that is where you have these i mean ayurveda has that vamana therapy where they induce vomiting 
to bring out all the bad stuff so that is from that old allopathy practice so that was what is origin allopathy so when people use the term allopathy now for a modern medicine doctor it's actually wrong because allopathy is nothing to do with modern medicine or modern medical science it is an old uh, medieval practice that was done uh, in its very crude form uh, centuries before so uh, this particular person samuel hanneman who invented homeopathy i mean he did it for uh, the good of the patient because he saw that doctors were making people vomit they were inducing diarrhea uh, they were bloodletting uh, thinking that uh, you know, removing bad blood would would improve somebody's disease conditions uh, they were doing something on a strapping where you put holes in the skull to bring out bad stuff out you know so much of crude things and people patients suffered from it so what he did was he uh, modified the treatments into a very gentle form called as homeopathy and called the other form as allopathy so allopathy is everything crude and crazy and uh, you know uh, torturous to the patient but homeopathy was the gentle way of treating things so instead of uh, using these crude substances like you know uh, at that time uh, heavy metals and synthetic materials and all that what he did was he diluted them so much that he thought that the essence of that substance would remain even it was ultra diluted and that essence in the substance would cure the patient of their illness so that is the whole aspect of vital force theory so uh, somebody would say how does homeopathy work because it's so diluted there is nothing active in it and you saying that it works but how can something without any active component in it work so the whole aspect of vital force theory comes in which is like an energy inside you and the ultra diluted material when it goes in it balances that energy and you get better which now sounds like complete horseshit because it is nonsense there is, there is nothing like that uh, but yeah. that was one principle of homeopathy the second principle was that like cures like so if you have a substance that can induce fever in you giving that substance can also reduce fever in ultra diluted forms so that is another another principle of homeopathy which does not make any sense because if something causes fever in you it it cannot cause it cannot treat fever in you it's as simple as that you know it's like saying that you know you had a snake bite and uh, there is lot of venom in you so let us take that snake venom and dilute it so that it ultimately becomes water and there is no venom left in it and then give you and then it gets and you get cured out of it you know it doesn't make any sense and uh, the third uh, principle is uh, your uh, ultra uh, the more the substance is diluted the more strong it gets the more potent it gets so these are the three principles that samuel hanneman made uh, against allopathy to bring in this gentle form of treatment now whatever happened at that time based on observations because homeopathy is a pre scientific era artifact you know it is not even science it's a pre scientific era thought and observation based on this particular person's wrong interpretation of what was happening in the body and about a complete uh, negligence on chemistry and physics we we know now know that uh, you know you don't dilute some stuff and think it's going to get more active that that, that doesn't happen at all in that case instead of uh, taking a single 500 mg of paracetamol we could actually dilute that paracetamol in 2 liters of water and take sips of that water and think of fever is going to go away <laughs> that doesn't work out that way so the whole aspect of homeopathy based on its principles is this and this is how it came up and this started in germany and a lot of other every, every other country took it up now the problem is that uh, homeopathy does not uh, it it still stands right i mean we have a lot of people promoting homeopathy a lot of people saying they got relief from homeopathy even governments are funding homeopathy so why why does that happen that is because uh, a lot of people who get relief from homeopathy gets relief from diseases that are mostly self limiting which means they did not require any treatment at some point it would go away on its own without any intervention for example allergies asthma especially childhood asthma uh, certain uh, seasonal infections or seasonal allergies these are the things that homeopathy is usually taken for uh, and at some point it goes away on its own and people wrongly think that the homeopathy medicine has or the formulation has uh, gotten them better now this is something known as anecdotal evidence so a lot of people have a lot of personal experiences with homeopathy and they they watch for it because it's they they felt it personally right so that's the biggest experience for them now when such multiple experiences come up 
it becomes like a cultish feeling because you'll see that okay this person i have i i had a, i have a child who has bronchial asthma who's not getting better because of seasonal exacerbations of the asthma and then this guy says even his kid had this asthma but then after taking 5 years of homeopathy it went away so what i'll do is my kid is already now uh, what i mean just give an example my kid is already now 7 years of age and he's uh, having asthma so i i try homeopathy along with it so i'm giving him inhalers and things like that on the side but i'm adding homeopathy also in it and now as per the natural natural history of the disease that bronchial asthma that childhood asthma will go away by by 12 years of age so i give him homeopathy and by the time uh, he is 12 years of age it goes away so he'll think that until 7 years i have been putting this child on i mean i'll think that i have been putting this child on uh, modern medicines until 7 years and nothing was happening but now i added homeopathy to it and the next 5 years the uh, asthma is gone so this is wrong interpretation of what was happening because asthma would have been gone even at five, even after that 5 years even without adding the homeopathy medicine so this kind of wrong interpretation of personal experiences or generalizing personal experiences to an effective intervention is what keeps homeopathy floating even now which is why you will see that there is no good scientific evidence to support homeopathy from any published data world over all scientific studies have shunned homeopathy and there is no absolute no, no reason for anybody to consume homeopathy as per scientific evidence but people still do it and homeopathy practitioners still promote it based only on anecdotal evidence or personal experiences from their patients and this is this is why why homeopathy stays longer and still keeps surviving now when you look at uh, i mean i'm not even going to go talk about what india is doing for homeopathy because a lot of tax payers money has been wasted studying it and uh, teaching people about homeopathy in india but when you look at other countries for example the place where homeopathy was born germany uh, it has defunded homeopathy from its public system so if you want to uh, take homeopathy treatment from uh, a practitioner you'll have to pay from your own pocket the government will not support you the government will not give you insurance or public money for that no more public funding is done for homeopathy in uh, france also it is not banned anywhere but it has been taken out of the mainstream equation and uh, the same thing is happening in the uk where the uh, national health service the nhs has completely defunded homeopathy and in the us it is now an alternative medicine practice where people if they want to come go, go for it can go for it but they'll have to pay from their own pockets because it does not get insurance and on top of that the center for inquiry which is a very think tank rational society in the us they have actually uh, taken uh, the homeopathy pharmacies to court so there is there is a huge supreme court case running there where they have taken these pharmacies um, uh, saying that they were defrauding patients by selling uh, watery substances as treatment options so a lot of uh, progressive societies and progressive nations are taking out homeopathy from the main equation and uh, this is what is really happening out, outside of india but in india we are still stuck with testimonials and happy with personal experiences hmm. Hmm. yeah this is this is quite quite surprising and obviously concerning i mean uh, so uh, if i if i have to say let's, let's say there are 10 medicines uh, you know in uh, homeopathy or 100 sort of medicines what and i know you may not have that data right now but again little bit of uh, as per your understanding how many of what percentage of it would be terribly you know bad for patients uh, or intoxicating or what percentage would you say are harmless like sugar pills so this is a tough question because um so we have data on what kind of homeopathy formulations have actually harmed the patient and they did contain a lot of stuff that we could identify uh, but but ideally if that particular homeopath is and i mean I, i i should not be using this term but then for the lack of word an ethical homeopath uh, he would be using actual homeopathy formulations properly prepared preparations of homeopathy which are ultra diluted substances and if i check i mean for example we have a uh, an ongoing project where we uh, known as a placebo project where we yeah. are looking at uh, toxicology analysis of commonly prescribed homeopathy formulations by uh, homeopathy practitioners and commonly uh, prescribed proprietary homeopathy formulations which are sold over the counter 
For example, uh, take the example of Arsenicum Album 30C, which was actually one of the classical homeopathy formulations, which was promoted by government for, as a preventive for COVID. It, it, did not, it does not work. But if you look at the classical formulation sold in the market, uh, when we checked about uh, 16 types of Arsenicum Album 30C, we could not find even a trace of arsenic in it. We could not even find anything. It was just water. You know, and in some, we did find some uh, little bit of uh, lactose, which is milk sugar. Sometimes they add that to the, I mean, they, um, what do you call, uh, dilute it in milk sugar. So we ultimately what we identified was water and milk sugar in those formulations. But what we did was when we looked at, um, there are there are companies who sell Arsenicum album in alcohol formulations. For example, they dilute it in alcohol. So when we looked at that formulations, we did not find a trace of arsenic in it. It was nothing. There was nothing there. No heavy metal, no arsenic at all. Even though it is named as Arsenicum album, no arsenic in it. But we did find 90% alcohol. Like absolute alcohol, strong alcohol in most of these medicines. So it depends on the kind of formulation that you would actually buy. So if you are going to buy a formulation, homeopathy formulation, which is diluted in alcohol, you will be ending up with alcohol pure, alcohol uh, as medicine but if you're going to buy a homeopathy formulation which is properly prepared as per its standards um, in saline or uh, uh, in milk sugar you'll end up with water uh, and sugar so it, it's all a problem because we don't know what kind of uh, formulations homeopaths are going to prescribe for you and what kind of formulations that you're going to buy over the counter so it's very difficult to exactly pinpoint how many percent would be but from what we have analyzed, a lot of classical standardized formulations contain nothing or what or alcohol. And a lot of the proprietary formulations contain a lot of active substances, including alcohol. Yeah, I am um, asking this question because if I see somebody going uh, over the counter or buying homeopathy medicine, uh, should I just run and stop the guy for my preferential family? Or sometimes you are like, Chalo, hai, let them enjoy their own placebo. Or it's more complicated than that. No, I would definitely stop them for two reasons. One is the potential to harm. So the, the, the drug that he's been or the formulation that he's buying may contain active ingredient that can harm him. Right. And Got the it. second yeah. is that he would be getting that homeopathy formulation for a particular disease for which he needs to take proper medicines. So by going for homeopathy, you're denying the right for real medicine. So in that sense also, he can get worse. So anybody who goes for homeopathy, I mean, forget the complication or toxicity, they should be stopped from going for homeopathy because that is not the real treatment. For example, I have a bacterial pneumonia and instead of going for antibiotics because I feel antibiotics is going to harm me more, I go for homeopathy. That infection is going to flare and it's going to get septic and I'm going to die of multiple organ failure if I go for homeopathy. So in that sense, somebody who always chooses homeopathy it's not just homeopathy that is harming but the sheer act of choosing homeopathy as a medical option for your health care that is wrong because that is not real medical care so you're denying good medical care by choosing homeopathy hmm. that that is actually uh, that is uh, that is quite concerning and and abby do you have some data of uh, how many millions of people consume homeopathy let's say on a daily basis in India. I mean, you just mentioned Bengal and Kerala are the largest consumers of homeopathy, but uh, which itself would account to, I don't know, couple of millions for sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, quite a bit. I, we don't, I don't have exact numbers, but, uh, but if you look at the business wise, there is a lot of uh, business booming. I mean, the, the, the graph has been going up about people on, on the business of homeopathy healthcare, but it's very interesting. Because whenever I say that, you know, homeopathy is not useful, it is a worthless, uh, you know, option for healthcare, uh, somebody will always put a comment saying that, you know, uh, some newspaper clipping or some social, I mean, some news media clipping saying that uh, the business of homeopathy has been increasing. Uh, you are saying on the side that homeopathy is useless and worthless, but see what is really happening. Homeopathy's business is actually increasing every year. So how can you say that it is useless? People are actually going for it and all. It's very interesting because a lot of homeopathy companies sell not only homeopathy formulations, but they even sell baby diapers and uh, soaps also. So if you look at uh, a particular company called uh, Baxon, which is Baxon's homeopathy, 
they sell uh, protein powders they sell uh, soaps they sell uh, perfumes and they sell a lot of other stuff other commodities which are not actually uh, medicines or uh, healthcare related uh, items so those are the things that have been increasing in sales and overall when you look at it you will think that you know the particular homeopathy companies products are increasing so which means homeopathy medicines are increasing that is wrong so this this whole aspect of homeopathy business booming is wrong because the business is not related to the homeopathy medicines it is related to lot of other surrogate things that the company is making like soap and toothpaste and brushes and what not and and hair dye one of the uh, largest selling homeopathy product is actually hair dye uh, from this particular indian company it's not a homeopathy medicine so the whole aspect of homeopathy booming is also actually wrong because we know uh, from the last few years of data that has been collected from the government that a lot of homeopathy government courses remain unfilled even now so people are not opting for it a lot of homeopathy shops have been shut down because of lack of business because they have moved on to uh, other supplements industry and all that and people are not coming for homeopathy uh, to, as a treatment initially and uh, the whole system is actually slowly collapsing on its own and i think at some point uh, much into the future we'll see that these these uh, kind of healthcare practices and medications will become completely trivial when it comes to real scientific care so two questions there uh, is it to say that uh, people are now trusting modern medicine more that's one or is ayurveda taking over the business of homeopathy is it is it that <laughs> no, ayurveda was always been uh, a top player uh, in healthcare when it comes to business uh but con- coming to that aspect of uh, are people opting for modern or med- or scientific medicine i would say that people are more informed now you know it was not like before because people have a lot of information now to assimilate at their fingertips it was not like be previously somebody used to say something and then they would go for it but now they can check fact check they can talk to their physicians there is a lot of data available on the net and whoever can logically uh traverse that particular information database on the internet they can have a fairly good idea about what healthcare practice is going to help them so the whole uh, aspect of uh, right to healthcare and the right to uh, effective healthcare that informed uh, aspect in the minds of people have improved which is why a lot of people now opt for uh, scientific medicine or at least ask their own doctors about other options that they would like to go for and the doctors will give them the right uh, answers to it uh, regarding ayurveda um, i i i still feel that ayurveda uh, will boom because it's not just a healthcare business it's it's a business of wellness and tourism also so homeopathy has n- no such aspects to it there is no tourism and wellness in homeopathy it's mostly to do with you know direct medical care but ayurveda has different a uh, lot of things going around it's not just a, a treatment therapeutic part but there is a lot of industries uh, from the tourism look at kerala a lot of the uh, business in kerala it's not because of uh, ayurveda doctors doing well with their prescriptions it's because of the wellness industry which is playing a huge part in the uh, tourism department so that way i think ayurveda definitely goes way and above homeopathy uh, but when it comes to uh, real patient care i think both of them are almost the same but i think ayurveda will harm more because if people use a lot of active ingredients in ayurveda uh, compared to homeopathy yeah absolutely and a lot to unpack there and also on the previous point of their business flourishing or not i i am i'm yet to come across a parent who would say that i want my kid to grow up and become a homeopathy doctor uh no no nobody would say that no i don't even i don't even think kids would actually Uh, want that because i had a person and an, uh, i mean i know the person because uh, he messaged me on uh, uh, privately on twitter and uh, he said that you know i'm uh, i did not get through my mbbs two times uh, and uh, ultimately my parents said that you know you're not going to waste another year just go into something that you get and he chose homeopathy so now he is in first year of homeopathy and he is very unsatisfied especially after seeing the stuff that i bring out on twitter and he wants to get out so he was asking yeah. me uh, what would what do i do about it so a lot of kids are trapped in it it is not anybody's uh, conscious choice to become a homeopath unless and until they have a homeopath business to run and they have to maintain that legacy 
then they might become a homeopath to run the business, not because they really want to treat people. Yeah, that, you, you're right. And I, I mean, I generally think a lot from this aspect, okay, how can we, uh, let's say if you and I were in positions of influence and power, how would we tackle homeopathy? Uh, because if we, if we ban it overnight, uh, we, we don't know the after effects uh, of the same. Uh, and what kind of reactions public would probably give. But what I do feel is, uh, if there is a thought through uh, uh, plan, uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So, so for example, let's say you and I are in position of influence, and rather than banning entire homeopathy in one go, if if the government would start banning certain medicines which have active ingredients, uh, then would that be more easy approach? What do you think? I mean, or or do you think outright uh, banning is blanket banning is the way forward? No, I, I don't think an outright ban would do any help because see, because a lot of people's livelihoods are based on this, right? I mean, where would the homeopaths who are doing practice now go? What, what would the students who just passed out of homeopathy do? Suddenly, if the government says homeopathy is complete nonsense and let us stop it. I, I think it has to be systematic in the sense that. Uh, first off, start with regulating the industry. because We don't regulate the practitioners now, but regulate the industry. For example, uh, ban the uh, medications where there is uh, where, where you feel that it can harm the public. For example, most of the home, a lot of homeopathic formulations have alcohol in it. And it's not just uh, simple alcohol. It's like really high levels of an absolute alcohol, 90% and all that. Ban those off the shelf. So that is taken care of. Next, go for these formulations where there are irrational uh, components in it. For example, there is a homeopathy syrup. I mean, there are multiple homeopathy pharmacies that make it a cuff syrup which contains cockroach. And uh, it has something known as blata orientalis, which is Indian cockroach. And uh, they make syrups out of Indian cockroach with water, uh, with alcohol or water. And they, and they sell it as, uh, I mean, I, I, I tweeted about this also, uh, including the companies. And uh, they feel, I mean, homeopaths think that uh, uh, giving diluted or ultra diluted form, forms of cockroach in alcohol will reduce cough. So such completely idiotic formulations should come off the shelves. And those formulations where they uh, use a lot of toxic heavy metals, for example, mercury or arsenic or something like that, those things should be off the shelf. So when you regulate that particular industry, you will see that a lot of it is taken care of. Because people will come to know that these medicines were actually not medicines to start with. And then slowly, the practitioners themselves will start to find ways to get around it. In the sense that a lot of homeopaths that I uh, have been interacting with in the last few couple of years, um, they are not actually practicing homeopathy. They have completed homeopathy, but some of them have gone into uh, the business of, uh, or in the, into, the, into, the, uh, into teaching. For example, they take up nutrition courses and they become nutritionists. Uh, some of them have gone into masters, taken taken a masters in hospital administration. Uh, previously, a lot of institutes who are not open to uh, people with bachelors in homeopathy, they are now open to people with bachelors in homeopathy for branching out. For example, we have public health diplomas, we have masters in hospital administration, we have medical transcription, we have nutritional courses. And these people are branching out. So they are basically doing things uh, that matter, which can impact the community much better than actually practicing homeopathy. So once this happens, I think the whole system will correct on its own. So we don't have to ban anything. And ultimately, when there are no takers for homeopathy at some point, the whole system will slowly shut down. And I think Holy. this is a natural process. Nothing imposed. Yeah, this is this, this kind of kind of makes sense. And also, I mean, if you and I tomorrow put a petition saying that we want ABC medicines which have cockroach uh, in it, that would be received more better than saying that I want homeopathy gone uh, after you know uh, afterwards. But uh, but but yeah. Uh, so uh, can you sh tell me? I mean, you receive every. Every week or every month, I think you receive some patients or almost every day which have gone serious, uh, which have suffered severely from homeopathy. Uh, would love to know, Abby, some incidents later recently which are which sort of maybe which were, which were which shook you 
or uh, or which you think should we should use this platform to raise some awareness around it so um i i think uh, one of the most important uh, cases that i have seen yeah. patients that i have seen when it comes to homeopathy uh, was this particular young man so he was he's a poly, he was a police officer about 30 31 years of age and uh, he had some you know uh, a symptom no symptoms a symptomatic benign uh, mild swelling of the legs for which he went for a uh, evaluation health checkup because the uh, the his senior police officers told him to just check it out uh, that was because of long term standing because his work was to stand and uh, guard the police facility and a lot of his time was either uh, spent standing or walking around and that that was the reason why there was swelling in the legs mild swelling but when he checked out uh, you know with tests and uh, scans and etc uh, they found out that he had multiple small stones in the kidney and uh, what he did was uh, he has heard that a lot of the treatment for kidney stones is by surgery you know doctors do surgeries and remove kidney stones so he was scared about that surgical prospect uh, but and then he started looking around and asking people and he, they said that you know homeopathy is a good option because it is gentle and you will not have any side effects so he went to a homeopath and uh, he prescribed him two sets of medicine one is known as berberis and the other one is known as sarasaparilla which is basically both are herbs and homeopathic formulations of these herbs he said that you take these your kidney stones will melt away and they'll pass out in the urine and you'll not you, you don't need to undergo any surgery the most important aspect here is that those kidney stones were not symptomatic it was just lying there small ones maybe about 3 mm to 4 mm in the kidney not doing anything to him harmless um usually kidney stones that are symptomatic which can come out and block the kidneys cause some infection or uh, cause repeated infections in the kidney leading to kidney damage those are the ones which we have to treat not these ones so basically he did not need a treatment for this particular condition but the homeopath gave him medicines anyways because saying that you know it will pass out with this medicines and it will get melted and things like that so this guy he took it for about a couple of weeks to 3 weeks as per his uh, instructions and uh, those medicines were actually mother tincture formulations which means they had very high levels of alcohol and they had active ingredients in them uh, these herbs were actively present in them he developed severe jaundice after about 3 to 4 weeks of consuming these two medications he probably would have finished about 4 to 5 of those bottles of homeopathic formulations developed severe jaundice loss of appetite and came to me so we looked at all other causes so when we have to identify a drug as a cause for liver injury it's always a diagnosis of exclusion which means you have to rule out all other causes before you say that it is this so we look at viruses we look at other alcohol use we look at other prescription drugs that he was on everything checked out negative and this was the only substance that he was taking at that time which led to that hepatitis and jaundice so this young man we treated him initially when I mean, this was biopsy prone also he had something known as a necrotic liver injury which means large portions of liver cells were absent on liver biopsy because they, those were damaged because of these uh, homeopathy formulations and he slowly and steadily progressed to liver failure where he started getting fluid in the abdomen and his jaundice increased up to about 20 to 30 bilirubin very high jaundice and at one point he started developing uh, infections so we had to treat the infections on the side uh, give support to his liver on one side and this went on for a few weeks without any improvement we we put him on a Uh, treatment on as plasma exchange where we remove bad plasma put in good plasma and reduce jaundice we did that also and uh, one week he improved a bit and then started showing increase in jaundice again but something that really happened uh, which was completely unexpected was that his bone marrow started failing um, so we had to deal with jaundice and hepatitis now on the side his hemoglobin his platelets his white cell count everything was crashing so he went into bone marrow failure so this was something known as acute hepatitis leading to aplastic anemia where some people develop severe liver injury and that affects the bone marrow also and this was a very rare thing and this he was a very young man so he, we did not know how to manage it because his liver was failing and his bone marrow was failing and both requires transplantation for a failing bone marrow the transplant is a bone marrow transplant for a failing liver the trans the answer is a liver transplant it's not easy to do bone marrow transplants and liver liver transplants together 
it's not practical and it's going to be very expensive and what I ultimately happened was that uh, this man I mean he was 31 32 at the time um, he knew that he was going to die he had no children and uh, his young wife she was I think about 24 or 25 um, she asked me what was going to happen to him and I looked at the literature and saw that uh, a lot of patients with hepatitis and aplastic anemia, they die. You know, I mean, they it's almost like 99% death without a proper bone marrow transplant. But we are dealing with a liver transplant also here. So for him, it was 100% death. So I tell her this in a very, uh, very understanding manner. I mean, I, I, talk, very, I talk very smoothly to these uh, family to make them understand that, you know, we are trying our best also. And it's not like, you know, he's going to die and that's about it. No, we try our best. So we, I talked to her about what was going to happen and she understood that he was going to die. And it, it, was, it was time for us to tell him also because he, uh, we needed to know that what was going to uh, happen to the wife once he goes away. So the whole aspect came to uh, she getting remarried. Just imagine the stuff that we have. I mean, I have to deal with in the OPD because of this nonsense product that was given to this man who did not require it in the first place. So the whole uh, family, the, the, that is the, the wife's cousins, uh, came to us and said, uh, uh, you know, she's going to get, she's going to be a widow. And uh, do you think it's okay for her to, uh, you know, remarry? And uh, is this jaundice? I mean, if people think that jaundice will spread, you know, some it's like, like an infection that is she going to get this jaundice later on because her husband had this jaundice and they were in a sexual relationship. I tell them that, no, no, this is not that kind of uh, a disease. Uh, this was because of the drugs and things like that. And ultimately, uh, the family all decided that uh, something that was going to be good for her was to make sure that we give comfort care for this man who was dying and uh, treat him for symptom care. So ultimately, they made a choice for end of life care. So they took him home. And uh, he died at home about, I think, about a month and a half or a couple of months after I diagnosed him with this liver disease. And uh, a while later, I mean, probably about three or four months later, uh, I mean, they had not collected the uh, major reports from our, from my unit. I mean, the biopsy reports and all. So somebody came to collect that after his death. So I, I casually asked what was happening. And uh, this uh, lady was not ready to uh, remarry. You know, she was remaining a widow at the time. And this was like maybe maybe four months. I mean, it's too early also. But uh, they were pressurizing her to move on in life. Uh, the, she had a small business uh, a provision store. Uh, she shut it down and she went into depression and a lot of stuff. I'm not, I don't know what happened after that because I have not been in touch with them. But this is what is happening. So people must realize that when I talk about uh, alternative medicine causing real harm, the story does not end there. The story starts there. You know, if you if the per family loses that person or the patient or they go into a morbid condition like, uh, you know, end of life care, where you have to care for a dying patient with the patient and the caretaker knowing that this person is going to die. Uh, I mean, you have to imagine what that does to the family. So when when uh, when I say that don't take this herb or don't take this homeopathy formulation because it has been proven to be uh, toxic, uh, people... Uh, can't think beyond that. They, they think that I am out to uh, criticize homeopathy or defame Ayurveda or defame India and defame our culture and our great tradition. It's absolute nonsense. That is what not I'm trying to do. I'm trying to tell you that there is a story that starts beyond that and people should understand. This is the, this is the reason why I wanted to speak about this uh, patient. Obviously, I've not given up, uh, given more data on it. I mean, this is anonymous. And uh, uh, the whole the whole family just crumbled after that because somebody decided to treat uh, this young man for a condition which did not require any treatment in the first place. So this was this was quite uh, concerning. So this was one story that will stick with me. Uh, I mean, till till I till my time is done here. So there are many such stories. I think we can uh, create uh, podcast after podcast on such stories, uh, which is something that I'm actually doing now. I'm writing a book. I have a a good uh, i got a good deal from a very nice publisher i'm working on this book where i'll be uh, writing immensely on uh, patient experiences about uh, on on liver health and disease where i i'll be giving realistic uh, matters on what from the patient's perspective too not just mine 
which I think will make people understand why they have to make informed choices on what healthcare they need to take up. And that has to be scientifically proven, validated, replicated, effective healthcare with side effects, but side effects are much, much lesser and the benefits outweigh the side effects. So that is what modern medicine is all about. I'm not saying modern yeah. medicine is side effect free. It has got side effects, but we know those side effects and we can definitely provide the safest care when it comes to benefits versus side effects. Absolutely. And we can't wait. When is the book due though? Probably next year because I have uh, extended my uh, submission dates to end of this year because I was supposed to finish it next to next month. In a couple of months, I am not able to do that because I underestimated my clinical practice a bit. I thought I could write in the night every day, which I am not able to. It's very exhausting. So hopefully I'll finish by the end of this year, writing it and submitting it. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just booking you in advance already. So whenever this book is out, uh, I am expecting you that uh, you know, I will be the first uh, podcast or we will be the first podcast to host you. We'll, we'll, we'll have uh, a nice chat on that also because a lot of things to talk about. I'm doing my best on that book. Absolutely. So coming to this patient story, did were the patient and the family, did they knew that the homeopathy is the cause and did their approach towards homeopathy change a little bit here and there? So I, um, I, I don't uh, see in my, in my real practice, I mean, I'm a different person on Twitter. I go all out against the homeopathy practitioners or sympathizers who come at me. But in real life practice, I, I don't believe in, uh, you know, persecuting the practice or the practitioner. But I uh, inform the family or the patient or the caretaker that, you know, this has, this is the reason that has led to this particular tragic moment and what i do is I, I i talk to them in a teaching manner where they'll understand the implications where they don't feel uh, bad about their decision see it's not their fault that they went for it because there was a lot of misinformation a lot of misleading aspects of healthcare that was move, going around that led to them to take the decision it was not their fault so when i when i talk about in that manner what they understand is that it is important for other people to also understand in this way so they'll go teach their family about what I have told them. They'll teach their neighbors. The neighbors will talk to other neighbors and the whole community will come to know about it. So that is how it goes. So I don't take any feedback about, uh, you know, I, I don't go asking like, will you go for homeopathy again? Or you see this has killed him. Now will you give homeopathy to your cousins also? I, I don't do that. Because I know once we set that process in motion, it will keep moving like a domino effect. And uh, the targeted or the needful message will reach the people in some or the other way where they understand it much better than uh, me telling them or taking a feedback from them and telling them to go and tell other people you know it does not it does not work that way but it it still does because uh, a lot of people a lot of patients who've been uh, you know completely uh, improved from uh, these i mean a lot of people improve from herbal medicine related liver injury and homeopathy liver injury, they improve because we give them good supportive care. So what they do is they bring other patients who are on these medic medications and tell them that, you know, these guy are, this guy is also on these herbal medicines. This guy is also on that homeopathy formulations. Please check them out. So that way it, it goes around because that way I get a feedback uh, from, uh, from my patients saying that, you know, these guys are bringing in other people who are going for unscientific practices, trying to correct them. So that feedback definitely comes back to me. And I'm, I'm very happy with that. Got it. And uh, what are sort of uh, areas which uh, homeopathy claims that it has the cure? For example, I definitely know cough, cold, asthma, uh, all the basic viral uh, fever, etc. I, I know that they have sort of championed the basic stuff. Uh, but are they are they now also claiming to treat, let's say, advanced uh, stuff or complicated stuff like I don't know? Maybe cancer or you know jaundice, typhoid, etc. I mean, uh, give a homeopath the opportunity to talk about <laughs> any disease; they will do that. <laughs> I I don't think they'll they got any uh, bells and breaks to apply there. They will just say that yes, we have a cure for this because they don't have to look further. They don't have any implications. They have no responsibilities because most of the stuff that they mislead patients on are chronic diseases. 
for which there there needs to be some kind of medical treatment or a follow up uh, for life for example take the uh, uh, take the example of um, cancers i mean there, there are different types of cancers which homeopaths don't know about but they'll say that you know this cancer goes into remission it can come back again so what you do is you take this formulation for another 10 years and you'll not come back so they treat that way so for them every opportunity is an opportunity to sell so it's not like uh, acute self limiting diseases any disease that you put on the plate they'll make uh, food out of it mm. very interesting and uh, there is there is this oh, there is this thing around uh, antibiotics that you should avoid antibiotics and all of that and watch for antibiotics not should not take antibiotics is this also part of the homeopathy uh, propaganda or is this i mean are generally antibiotics we should be careful with antibiotics so i think there is there are two messages there one is that um, definitely there is something known as a propaganda known as chemophobia which not just homeopaths but the whole of alternative medicine industry uh, stakeholders practitioners sympathizers promote that is they say that modern medicine is all about chemicals and we are natural and chemical free but everything is chemicals i mean the chair i sit on is chemical the food i eat is chemical everything is chemicals and what they do is that they have pushed this agenda that modern medicine is all about synthetic stuff and uh, ayurveda or homeopathy is not synthetic it is more of appealing gentle and natural stuff which does not uh, toxicate you you know intoxicate you uh, this is definitely where these antibiotics and painkillers and all feature because they'll say that it's all chemicals and we don't have but the fact is that they they add these antibiotics and painkillers to the drugs to make it effective that is another story but uh, to look at it another way definitely antibiotic abuse is a big problem uh, over prescription is a big problem uh from the doctor community from the patient community from the general population per perspective it is a big issue because for every silly thing for every thing every simple self limiting seasonal fever people are uh, popping antibiotics like uh, it's uh, candy you know for example when covid came in azithromycin was one antibiotic which was overly prescribed because some uh, study which was a very bad study now retracted Uh, from scientific publication uh, it 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 showed that azithromycin would probably be useful for uh, covid and so everybody including doctors senior doctors infectious diseases specialist also they started prescribing azithromycin for every covid patient so this did, i mean obviously this this does not help covid at all but it actually worsened antibiotic resistance in the community so when to some extent when somebody says that don't use antibiotics unnecessarily or antibiotics can cause harm i agree with it because antibiotics if it is irrationally used not used judiciously uh, it can cause more harm in the form of antibiotic resistance or multi organ resistance but on the other hand that is not the message that the alternative medicine practitioners are giving they are giving the message about chemophobia so antibiotics feature in their propaganda it does not feature for the greater good of people for example with respect to antimicrobial resistance or drug resistance it features uh, as a business tool where they would mislead patients away from antibiotic therapy when it is needed towards a therapy like a herbal therapy or a homeopathy therapy which would actually harm them more for example a classic example is the case of a tuberculosis patient who was on homeopathy medicines for over many months the homeopath actually prescribed homeopathy medicines instead of uh antibiotics for tb claiming that uh, tb uh, medicines would actually injure the liver i agree to that point there are lot of cases of tb medicine related liver injury which are which is completely reversible manageable but that does not mean that you don't treat tb patients with those medicines you treat them because the benefits are much more than the risk so this homeopath started treating this patient without anti tb medicines and with only these homeopathy uh, water formulations and ultimately the patient died of complications of the infection so these things are realistic so uh, indulgence in promoting chemophobia is the tactic where uh, these people use modern medicine as one of the fulcrum where they uh, instigate fear in people on synthetic medicine versus natural medicine mm, yeah this is a, this is this is very good i mean i've been thinking when he was speaking that healthcare has so such a complicated beast 
uh and by beast i don't mean to attribute a negative connotation to it but healthcare is generally so complicated for an average person like me uh, to even make sense of uh, and and i am some you know i'm i have the privilege of internet i have i have decent network and i can make sense of it through people like you but there is a ton on vast majority which will just follow uh, what probably the crowd has asked them their family members have asked them uh, they will go in a direction it's very easy for you know for us to mold them in a particular direction and i am i'm generally genuinely very concerned i mean uh, i mean and there are there are areas i mean we are now talking about forms of medicine but uh, even in in the modern medicine ecosystem like we talked about people are made fool of and uh, it just everything is so damn concerning abi to be honest i mean it's very i mean when you said that healthcare is a very complicated or complex beast i agree with you you know why because um, see for example i i put up a tweet saying that uh, <clears throat> milk thistle is not good for the liver i mean it is true i mean i i'll be doing a video on this soon because a lot of people are misled on this and you have a lot of products in the market where milk thistle or silymarin is added as a detox and liver protector and what not and uh, it doesn't work i mean there are a lot of studies including high quality meta analysis that shows that milk thistle use does not do anything for any liver disease it's it's complete uh, it's a complete waste of money so i put that so a guy who is uh, studying i mean i mean his profile says that uh, he is an it engineer or or a, or a businessman in in the in the middle east he puts up a two three pubmed articles uh, which are reviews on milk thistle saying that claiming that you know it is useful for this useful for that but based on molecular level evidence cell based evidence and it's not even human studies and he just keeps doing that like a it's like carpet bombing on my uh, under my tweet so i tell him that you know uh, i mean you, if you have no knowledge about this particular point you should not even talk about it and this happens only in healthcare so if a plumber or a carpenter tells me that or tells a person that you know this this piping should go like that way and go this way or uh, the measurements of this particular table should be this way the length should be this way so that it it remains steady we just listen to that i don't i we don't say that the, to the plumber guy no 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 it's you go that side let's go this side no that is that is his uh, domain expertise and he says that you have you accept it but when it comes to healthcare people have so many opinions on their own even when they know nothing about it and i i think this is why healthcare has become a complex beast because people think that it is a place where they can opinion i mean they can provide opinions on from their own uh, ill informed uh, you know uh, in a position and this is why it is getting more and more complicated to deal with healthcare so when i i don't talk about obstetrics and gynecology i don't talk about urology i don't talk about cardiothoracic surgery I mean, I do talk about general medicine per se, but I mostly speak on liver, on hepatology and its aspects because that is what I am trained in. And no other doctor would actually talk about hepatology or anything. I mean, proper doctor trained in urology or 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 maybe uh, neurology, they would not talk about hepatology aspects per se on a daily basis. But when you look at the uh, the the people on Twitter or on social media, common folk, they have no qualms about. just speaking their minds on anything that comes to comes to their mind on healthcare this is why it is becoming complex because people have a lot of confirmation biases and they have a lot of prejudices regarding their own healthcare that they are not ready to accept it from an expert they they don't they don't consider doctors as actual experts anymore they think doctors are there to make business they are here to push pills and prescribe pills on to you and get money out of it and things like that i don't understand that psychology of it but if you look at any other expertise area like like i said a carpenter or a plumber or or a mechanic i don't think people give their opinions on what they should be doing you know what they tell them that becomes the final word but healthcare it's so much more complicated i i'll tell you a very recent incident uh, regarding my grandfather uh, uh, when when we were in the hospital uh, so like i mentioned right like his lungs were not functioning it has a lot of infection in it uh and uh, he was eventually on oxygen support and and uh, 
so he was first i think he was on bipap and then he was on cpap and the only other option was on ventilator and uh, he, his last wish was that he did not wanted to be on ventilator and we wanted to respect it and there were two schools of thought running i mean he he passed away on 19th morning and uh, till 18th there were two two schools of thoughts there was there were some on ground doctors in the icu who were who i was speaking to in private and they were saying that uh, you know he don't have a lot of time maybe one or two days and i think you should just take him home and let him go peacefully and then there was one school of thought which was like the head doctor he was trying to give us hope and uh, he was trying to tell us that you know what uh, let's just fight till the end and uh, let's see what we can do for him let's let's try to you know put him alive and you know let's try to get his uh, his lungs functioning again let's try to remove the infection and all sort of things and uh, there was still there was still some hope and and they did a small experiment uh, sort of they, they they tried to remove his oxygen support uh, for 30 seconds or a minute and just wanted to see that for how long can he sustain on his own and he could not even sustain for a minute and i think that was uh, that was a, that was the time that i knew that he does not have a lot of time but even after that uh the head doctor was telling my father that you know we will fight for it we will we'll fight for it we'll go for it uh and these are very complicated dilemmas that patient families are sort of uh are sort of given uh and uh, i mean we decided to put him in on the hospital for as long as we could uh but there were a lot of people in our family and even telling us even privately even doctors as well that take him home uh that is the best thing for him uh how, how do you deal it deal with such a situation i mean it was it was a decision that me and my father had to made i mean but we did made and we are at peace with what we made but these are some dilemmas that how do you respond to this i don't know i have no idea um i mean i think this is such an important question uh because i deal with the situation almost every day of my practice every single day because i have a very sick group of patients all the time in the icu and uh, liver disease is very punishing you know it it's it's uh, i mean even for the doctor and for the patients very punishing because a lot of people die because ultimately most of them require a transplant and they can't afford one or cannot get one on time so we have to deal with a lot of deaths now what happens is that um when when the 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 senior doctor like, like you said who was saying that let's keep on going and going let's let's fight all odds swim against the currents at some point doctors must uh learn how to let go so uh, i mean initially if you ask me um uh, i would definitely uh, fight for all my patients you know i would not let them go this was probably about maybe 4 4 5 years back when i started off treating patients especially critically ill liver disease patients i see them crashing around me all the time and i was like uh, you know you can't just let them go you know the family is waiting outside every the whole um, environment is so negative you have to bring some positivity to it so this is the the way to bring positivity is to talk positive even if the patient is going to die 110% you talk positive so i keep saying that let's hope let's hope let's do it let's hope, do it but i know deep inside and this is some kind of a cognitive dissonance that uh, doctors have when faced with death of the patient uh, they they feel let down at one point because they are not able to salvage that patient but they don't want to accept that because they have been uh, given the responsibility to care for that patient not just the patient but also the family so what they do is they know if when they are alone that this patient is going to die in their minds i understood that you know this patient is going to die but i can't i can't say that to the family because the family is definitely keeping hope and i have to keep their hopes high so i used to treat all my critically ill patients with that kind of hope all the time even though i knew that they were going to die now when few years passed by uh, i started looking at it from another way so i it's not just the patient and the family around it it's a lot of other things for example it's about the money uh it's about uh, who the person is that you are going to fight for it's about how much of fight is left in the patient not just the doctor and how much the patient's family is willing to invest in that fight so all of this matters 
so then i understood that financial burden is such an important aspect in healthcare so this this really hit me because there was this particular patient a uh, very young guy uh, who was very sick and he was definitely going to die and i did not know this i i kept on giving the family hope uh, when i knew that patient was dying and ultimately when he died the whole family just crashed i mean i have not seen such wailing i mean i'm not even saying crying i'm saying wailing i have not seen such wailing from the family members over the death of a patient like i did at that time because not only they lost the patient they actually lost the house where uh, you know the the i mean their small plot of land and the house also you know why because he was the breadwinner and they put that particular uh, small plot of land and house as mortgage as a bank loan to give i mean to provide uh, to spend for that healthcare that this man was getting and they actually thought that he was going to survive because if he was going to survive then they could pay back that loan because he is the breadwinner but ultimately what happened was that he died and they took a loan out of that uh, by keeping their small land and house and they are going to lose that also because there is no way they can pay that back so see the devastation from both sides so i found out that it's not about just you know doing what is go all all what is right for the patient it's also doing what is right for the family and this makes a big difference and this is when you think logically and rationally and you become part of the patient's family you become part of you put yourself in the shoes of the patient and the family so if i am 100% sure that uh, i can salvage a patient and that can lead to benefit from both ways from for the family and the patient i go all out i give hope otherwise i am very realistic and that person that senior doctor who spoke to you and your dad hopefully I mean, he is a senior person. I am not judging anybody, but I I think there are a lot of doctors like that who have difficulty in letting patients go. And I think it's a very good um, virtue to keep as a doctor because you don't want to let your patients go. But also, you you need to be human at that point because you want to know whom to let go, when to let go, and why to let go. And this is very important. And a lot of people who gave you the other aspect of it, saying that take him home. uh let him be comfortable they they think more than the treatment they treat they think around the treatment too and i think that is a very good way of thinking when it comes to doctors to patients when you're going to deal with a critically ill patient especially and i think doctors should learn this it's it's very important because you can uh peacefully make the family accept it and also provide them some comfort some closure about the decisions because it's not just the family making the decision it's the doctor along with the family making decision they are it's it's a friendly decision it's never a bad decision it's a positive decision hmm. yeah and when you are saying a lot of questions were you know you know essentially popping uh, in my head uh, one 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 pattern that i've seen specifically from my hometown in door and i have seen i visited most icus there is uh, especially senior doctors who are above 40 45 when they visit they come for an icu round they would give you, give you 2 minutes 3 minutes 4 minutes maximum on a daily basis uh, sometimes they are you understand sometimes they feel enough but i never felt in my limited experience i mean i am just 31 right i mean what is i have not visited i have i have not visited so many hospitals so far but whatever limited experience i have seen uh i expect that when somebody is on the bed in the icu suffering and you have to treat it i expect doctors to give me at least 15 20 minutes uh if possible every day because every day is very very important uh and especially if some, somebody is on oxygen support uh to craft out a strategy uh think of all possible outcomes and measures explain me the daily treatment explain me what has changed what has not changed from yesterday or today uh tell me that what is going to be the plan of the day uh walk me through it and make make a decision and help me make a decision uh abi am i thinking too much here uh, don't do, don't you think this is a basic expectation and it this sometimes doesn't happen like like doctor will come up like this say he he look into the prescription he look into the vitals he'll spend 2 minutes with you 
tell you this is the plan and you quickly move to the next patient no i don't think this is an over expectation i think this is perfectly fine for a patient family to expect this from the doctor um see this is this is the whole aspect of healthcare right communication um so a lot of diseases um especially chronic ones they have they play out their own natural course you know there is nothing you can do about it you can probably uh, apply breaks on that natural progression or you may actually uh, provide comfort to the patient during that chronic period of illness but ultimately what is more important is that for the patient to understand what he is going through and what he needs to expect and the family to understand what they can offer the patient to improve the rest of his life to the best extent and i think this 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 can only be provided by the doctor i mean who else will provide such an information right everybody has to be on the same page so i i know that i see a patient one day and i know that this patient might land up in a liver transplant in couple of years and i don't talk about it at all and after 2 years i suddenly tell them that you know now you have to go for a transplant so that might be really shocking because they they won't be ready for a transplant they would not have saved any money they would not have identified a donor everything will become so chaotic at that point so what i do is that i discuss with them regarding and i think every doctor should follow this i mean not because i follow it but because this is the right way as 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 per the principles laid down in clinical practice is to discuss the decisions for the day and then discuss the decisions for the follow up I mean so many things come unexpectedly for example i have had very stable liver patients coming in uh, within a week with massive blood vomiting they go on a ventilator they don't give me enough time to work on them and then they die everybody is so confused including me because i was not expecting that but what i do is i tell them natural history of the disease i tell them that you know there is cirrhosis this is cirrhosis and cirrhosis has these many complications so you can have fluid build up in the abdomen you can have blood vomiting you can have severe infections some patients can go into liver failure you can have a progression of jaundice so many things are there in this disease and this disease uh, always comes with unexpected uh, complications so please know about this so you if you feel that you are facing any of these please come to me as early as possible so they know that there is there can be a time when they can vomit blood they may not actually vomit blood at all but there will be a time when they will actually vomit blood or when there will be a time when they will actually get severe liver uh, severe infections they can land up in the icu they know about it and once that is in place when i have to deal with that complication they'll understand why this complication came and what i'm doing going to do for it similarly uh, when that particular patient is with that particular complication in the icu i have to tell them exactly what i'm going to do for that complication right so i know that i know a patient who can actually improve with antibiotics for the infection and i know a patient who will not improve with antibiotics because he has a severe infection so all of this becomes part of simple basic humanism basic communication basic uh, uh, courtesy between the doctor and the patient i don't think this has nothing to do with over expectations this is what it is ultimately clinical medicine and practice of medicine is all about people coming together and doing what's right by somebody who's really sick and communication becomes the central part of it the rest will play on its own yeah absolutely i mean i hope more doctors adopt it and what i'm seeing abi is that young doctors are more sensitive to it and uh, you know i think i think Uh, i could be wrong but uh, i mean the the little older older generation believes in this old philosophy of uh, giving them hope and saying that we are doing everything in but don't worry about it we are doing fine the kind of this kind of setup but the young ones are more they take into consideration multiple factors and then they they are trying to give you a very very transparent picture do you, have you felt that as well um i mean i'm not very sure about that because uh i i see a lot of i mean i I'm, i may be biased here but a lot of uh, young uh, gastroenterologists uh, or young uh, young specialists that i see um they are easily uh, you know they easily let go you know there, there's oh. a difference between letting go and letting go easily so for example when i uh, see a patient with uh, severe alcohol associated hepatitis i give them the first line treatment 
um no response second line treatment no response third line treatment not response and the last line is to go for a transplant but practically or log- or practically or you know logically for the you know, family a transplant is out of the question so what next as per the guidelines uh, i can just let go because the guidelines say that he needs a transplant and without a transplant he is going to die and uh, i can easily let go because there is nothing more that i can offer but i do uh, stool transplants for such patients because now there is upcoming evidence and research from my own group uh, a lot of published data saying that uh, changing the gut microbiota or the intestinal bacteria can actually improve the life quality and improve increase life of patients with severe alcoholic liver disease who are not candidates or who did not respond to any of the previous lines of treatment so in that sense what i'll do is i'll i'll try and put that patient on stool transplant and it see if it'll benefit or not so that way i am not letting go but if the stool transplant does not work out because it's anyway a salvage option a therapeutic a, an experimental treatment option if it does not work out then i have to make uh, you know i have to uh, first uh, you know make myself understand that you know this patient is going to die because you have tried everything but what, what that that particular decision came after i did everything from my side but i think a lot of young uh, specialists that i meet with now they are very very uh, casual towards the whole uh, attitude of uh, when to let go and when to hold on so in that sense i feel that we have to strike a balance where you give your 100% but then you make sure that your 100% did not work out or you know that it is not going to work out even if you give the 100% and then you decide that you know it's time to let go so i think the older generation is too empathetic or too much invested into the aspect that medical care can salvage and the young and there is another spectrum where they say that you know whatever you do this is what is going to happen and there is nothing we can do more so let's just relax and deal with it you know i think we have to strike a balance between both and that is what actually helps the patient yeah Uh, and abhi do you also think there is uh, there is a lot of ageism in indian healthcare where if an elderly senior patient is there then people there is often you know and both of us can be limited with our experiences but i mean this is uh, this is i think that i have started to witness where somebody who is let's say 80 85 plus would come in uh and uh, doctors would be not as aggressive and they would they would often use these phrases that see anyway he is so old let's see we are trying our best uh they would they would they would no not go all in to save uh that particular patient uh, do you do you also think that i mean but to tell you frankly openly i was also like that at some point you know where i would get an 85 year old cirrhosis patient with fluid in the abdomen and we know from scientific publications that if somebody develops ascites which is fluid in the abdomen the average uh, life expectancy would be somewhere around i mean the average survival would be somewhere around 2 uh, years it's that short and i would see an 85 year old and say that oh you know this guy is actually survive for 85 years i am already seeing 30 year old and 28 year olds dying what is the big deal we'll just take care of him as, as you know as per standard thing but then slowly and steadily i mean we have to understand that an 85 year old is also a patient who's a father to somebody who is a brother to somebody um, who is a son to somebody i mean even though his parents would have died but he is someone to somebody there so he would have grandsons who love him he would have Uh, had uh, he has uh, brothers who love him still surviving members of the family who love him so for them he's 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 an important person and it is important that you make sure as a doctor that you can prolong that person survival as much as you can you won't be able to cure him of his illness but you can definitely improve his quality of life increase his survival uh with service giving actual medical care even though it is i mean aggressive or not that is which is required and make sure that he spends more time with his family that that he deserves so if he did not have cirrhosis and its complication he would have survived for another 5 years until the age of 90 but now he has cirrhosis and complications he will survive up to maybe 2 years but if you can add another year to it because of your 
medical management, say three more years. Fantastic. That is what your aim should be. So your, the, the goals of treatment is different for different groups of people, different groups of uh, patients and different ages of patients. And I think doctors should realize this. So you don't treat everybody saying that, you know, uh, this man is old, that person is young, so let's concentrate more on that and let's concentrate less on this. That is not real medicine. So this part of flawed thinking in clinical medicine, I have completely uh, shattered it, threw it out of the window and I don't think about that anymore because for me, every patient who comes in deserves uh, a quality of life and deserves a life which is which if we can offer them much more than what the disease would uh, offer and I think this is most important. I think, uh, yeah, you're right. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, let, we have uh, roughly an hour left. Uh, so many topics remaining. But let, we'll, let's just spend a couple of minutes uh, before I, I would go to asking fundamental questions of what is beneficial for liver and not. Uh, let, let's just spend a couple of minutes, Abhi, on Ayurveda. Uh, and yeah, it's an I mean, open-ended the, the I mean, elephant just, in the just room. Like homeopathy. Yeah, it's the it's the elephant in the room. And my biggest concern with Ayurveda is because uh, uh, homeopathy is still considered. It does not have the interlinks of culture, and uh, it does not have the baggages of uh, uh, the nation, statehood, that uh, and uh, history, and uh, etc. And religion to it. Uh, yeah, while Ayurveda is. It, it it just it just it just gets complicated and complicated and the worst part is the legitimacy that it has been gotten in the past eight ten years. Uh, it is it just it just too much. And uh, where do we begin even to talk about Ayurveda? Um, I mean, see my my first experiences with Ayur, I mean my only experiences with Ayurveda before I started practice practice as a super specialist. Was that it is? Uh, it it was a tourism kind of a business industry. That was my understanding of it, and nothing more than that. I never realized that a lot of people, a large segment of our population, considered this as healthcare. You know, for the yeah. treatment of their diseases and things like that. I never knew that. And uh, for me, it was like wellness, a massage here, a shirodhara. It's so nice. It's very nice. And I've done all that. It's so nice. I mean, the wellness part of Ayurveda is it's it's something that everybody should experience, but. When I actually looked at, uh, I mean, into my practice, when I started seeing patients with herbal liver injuries and a lot of these uh, unscientific uh, medical formulations uh, harming people in the long term or in the short term because, because they were misinformed or they did not have good uh, information regarding the best healthcare choice for the particular disease. I started feeling that, you know, Ayurveda has to be uh, dealt with. First, I have to understand what it was before I, I tell people about it. So a lot of people say that, you know, you are a modern medicine doctor, what do you know about Ayurveda? I'm sure a lot of people on Twitter who uh, criticize me or comment against my post on Ayurveda does not even know one by hundredth of what I know about Ayurveda. Because I have been uh, in the company of Ayurvedas. I have been, I have read through all the syllabus texts. It, I lost about nine months reading all of that. But it, it was it was worth it because I got to know a lot about what this practice was all about. And also I deal with people who have directly uh, come to face harms of this practice also. So I have a lot of lot of baggage, a lot of luggage that I did not ask for, but I carry it because uh, I can I can uh, make people understand better when I carry this baggage for them. So when I started off seeing, uh, Ayurvedic herbal liver injury, it was just herbal liver injury, right? So there was nothing beyond it. So there is an untested product or a untested formulation or a contaminated untreated formulation that is causing harm. Simple, straightforward. So I say that uh, Giloy, Tinospora cordifolia herb can cause immune mediated liver injury whereby some people can actually develop severe liver failure and die. And when I looked at all the evidence from Giloy, from scientific publications, I found out that there was nothing in it. I mean, it was not actually useful for anything. We have a lot of uh, opinion, opinionated narrative reviews. We have a lot of cell-based cell and tissue-based studies. You have a lot of computational studies. But you don't have any good quality human studies to prove that this is useful for anything, this herb. So tell that to people. So that is what I did. 
So I said that giloe is not useful. It is very harmful. And uh, it is used in a lot of Ayurvedic products. Please don't use that. Don't go for giloe and things like that. Bang came all the responses, which has nothing to do with giloe. So it came as Hindu phobia. It came as Christian missionary. It came as you are a rice bag. It came as you are a Western colonial mind. It came as you anti-national and so many things like that. So when such a thing started happening, I mean, including my own fraternity. So there, there is this cancer surgeon on Twitter who has now blocked me. And I have also blocked him. Uh, who was completely harassing me. I mean, from the word go. So initially, this guy was very, he was pals with me. So I used to share about patient stories and whatever in liver health and whatever. But when it came to Ayurvedic liver injuries and all, this guy started taking a U-turn. So he started uh, taking screenshots of mine and then, uh, you know, abusing me on the side. And these are like really bad religious abuses. I mean, religious kind of uh, racist messages that he was throwing at me. And I, I saw that, you know, this guy is actually a doctor. He's a, he's a cancer surgeon. He should not be talking like this to me or about me because we are all the same fraternity. We want good things for our patients. So whenever there is unscientific evidence, that is a general general thing. Doctors should fight unscientific uh, matters for the betterment of the patient. But this guy was doing the exact opposite. So I looked at Ayurveda differently. right? So I, I started looking at it not as a simple healthcare or an alternative practice, but at its core is religion. Simple as that. Ayurveda has different aspects to it. It has a religious background because everything comes from the Vedic texts. It is, it is. Um, I mean, if you look at all the old, um, late 1700s, early 1800s uh, scriptures, I mean, uh, uh, manuscripts written by foreigners, by, by Europeans and Americans on uh, Indian traditional medicine, they used to call this as Hindu medicine. H-I-N-D-O-O, Hindu medicine. That was what the pra practice was known as. Then obviously now it's Ayurveda and we all use Ayurveda as the general term. But ultimately it was all about religion, culture, tradition. It was all about everything else other than science and evidence. So I found out that there was a group of people who are educated, literate, intelligent, but still illogical and irrational. So there was a lot of doctors who were abusing me because I was... Um, critical about Ayurvedic practices and things like that. And then it, it went beyond that. You know, it's not about herbal liver injuries anymore because it has a lot of other aspects to it. For example, uh, anything to do around Ayurveda became part of Ayurveda. For example, yoga. Right. So the maximum yeah. number of abuses that I got, I get on Twitter is when I talk about two things. One is turmeric and one is yoga. And yoga is like crazy. People gave me death threats. You can't imagine. When I said yoga is not an exercise because it is anaerobic. It is not an aerobic way of activity. So it's not an exercise. And classical yoga is just postural balances and a lot of other spiritual mindfulness and things like that. So it is not an actual exercise. It is not aerobic. It is anaerobic. By God, the, the, the kind of abuses that I received all over just because I said that, it was crazy. So there was everything other than a rational scientific criticism going around. And I think this is what Ayurveda and yoga and I mean anything to do with that practice specifically is. For people, they don't care about the science. You know, they, they, they just want to criticize without any actual sub, uh, substantial uh, claims backing their criticism. Right. So this is what Ayurveda from what it started as a herbal liver injury has now reached. So now I'm I'm the guy who's now against everything that Indians uh, hold so dearly from religious, cultural, <laughs> traditional point of view, uh, which is not the I, actual thing. I'm I'm just a doctor trying to inform people about what is best for their healthcare. But things are turning around uh, everywhere else other than that. Okay, so hold on. Are you saying that even yoga is uh, sham? I would I would take this as I won't call it a sham because um, what I would I would take this as in another sense that I would say that there is nothing additional or nothing more glorifying in yoga compared to an equivalent physical activity. 
for example when you say that um, yoga is good for uh, fatty liver disease i would say no it is not that is that is misleading but if i Correct. if somebody says that yoga is good uh, again compared to no activity i would definitely say yes that is true doing yoga uh, is much better than doing nothing but i would i would not say i would not agree to the fact that uh, doing strength training in the gym and doing cardio is inferior to yoga or yoga is equivalent to that that is not correct i i would fight that information you know that way but i'm not saying yoga is a sham but i'm i'm saying that yoga has its benefits and most and of those benefits are yeah and limitations and most of those benefits are anecdotal and personal and a lot of these benefits are seen with similar uh, activities other than yoga also i mean just walking cycling is much a bit, much better than doing classical yoga so you have rigorous vigorous forms of yoga which i am not calling it as traditional i am talking about traditional classical yogas as written in patanjali sutra or hatha yoga which is classical yoga i mean when you look at it uh, if you look at the principle so when i call something pseudo scientific i am not calling the practice pseudo scientific i am calling it the principles of the practice pseudo scientific so for example when i say like we discussed homeopathy is pseudo scientific why because the principles are not scientific you're calling like cures like and vital force and energy and all as part of your treatment it is unscientific so that is why your uh, homeopathy is pseudo scientific when i say yoga is uh, unscientific or pseudo scientific it be- it is because the principles that is written in yoga scriptures about the benefits of yoga or how yoga works are all unscientific for example the bindu in your head going down and then uh the the bad all all your uh, energy getting ejaculated with the semen is what causes disease is what is written in the classical yoga scriptures no it is it is i'm i'm, I'm not joking it's what is written and i have written about it on twitter also so they have when you do yoga the bindu again rises up to its moon position and your digestive fire is maintained and that is how you get healthy come on this is absolute nonsense nobody can actually prove it all this stuff bindu and the digestive fire and all that so that Chakra, way yoga is also chakras is a totally different thing yeah i mean it's there chakras is there it comes in its spirituality part of it so yoga has a lot of unscientific stuff in it and people should accept yeah. it it's it's i mean th- that is what it is that is what are, oh, oh, that is all what i'm saying look at ayurveda it is completely pseudo scientific when i say pseudo scientific people are coming with daggers to to stab me why why am i saying it's pseudo scientific because the principles of ayurveda is based on old pre scientific era thought on humoral theory like air water wind and fire and crap like that come on nobody believes in that anymore it has been obsolete that is old greco or roman thinking also which nobody even uh, talks about these days so when you are going to diagnose or treat a patient based on those kind of principles now on uh, into 2023 that's pseudo scientific that's 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 quackery that's fraud so this is what i'm saying so when if people can understand from a logical and rational point of view about what points are been raised on that topic i think a lot of this hate and harassment will actually die down but people don't want to do that they just love criticizing and making things chaotic got it and uh, this question is uh, that i'm going to ask you is partially a troll question but it's partially a serious question also i mean do you intend to do some research on cow urine no absolutely not because cow urine is equal to human urine i would rather use human urine because it's easy for me to source than than a cow urine <laughs> because uh, uh, yeah i mean we should look at the resources also right so b- basically the whole aspect of cow urine also i mean look at it it's it's all about uh, everything about, everything other than science it's it's got a lot of religious um, sympathies to it it has got a lot of cultural emotions at play a lot of traditionality because if you look at the scriptures uh, from i mean ayurvedic classical texts as written in charaka samhita and all that you can see that a lot of treatments did use cow urine as part of mixtures and, th- and as part of preparation so it all amounts to what was uh, written in the scriptures the 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 vedic aspects of how those treatments came into being how those observations were uh, thought to be useful at that time so when somebody says that cow urine is actually unscientific pseudo scientific it's directly 
uh, for some people it is directly implicating that their religious beliefs are wrong right so it it, it becomes everything other than scientific uh, discussion so this is why i i think uh, there is no actual hypothesis for us to actually um, study cow urine in the first place so why why do you want to study that so i i would never do such a research because there is nothing no shred of evidence from a hypothetical point of view to show that doing the study will give us some benefit in some particular condition there is nothing like that so if you have nothing to start with why waste all the resources makes sense and, and any recent ayurvedic uh, medicine slash drug that you have encountered which have been very taken you by surprise yes so um, i mean i i did tweet about this but we are now preparing a, a large series of patients who have developed severe liver injury due to ashwagandha so oh. ashwagandha is like yeah ashwagandha is like the poster boy of ayurveda you know now that we have brought down giloy from the pedestal ashwagandha has taken uh, the pedestal now so ashwagandha it's it's not just ayurveda but there is a lot of there are a lot of dietary supplements in the west especially in the us markets that contain ashwagandha which is promoted for a lot of things for example sexual health in men and women increasing testosterone in men boosting immunity uh, as as something that would increase exercise tolerance build muscle mass and you know, so many things so ashwagandha is marketed yeah. for a lot of things and it has a lot of um, scriptural backing i mean ayurveda talks a lot about it ashwagandha and uh, there are also a lot of very poor quality uh, but scientifically sounding uh, publications on ashwagandha especially from a particular company which markets this particular formulation of ashwagandha known as i think it's known as k66 uh, ks66 i think it's known as a, a particular formulation of ashwagandha which they claim is purely from the root and no leaves are added and this is the most most purest form of ashwagandha and they have done a lot of studies on ashwagandha very low quality low level studies but beautifully sounding titles like randomized control trial and things like that they've added to a title but when you when you look at it the st- those studies are absolutely uh, bogus very low quality based on such low quality evidences a lot of people are going for ashwagandha for a lot of things for example <clears throat> reduction in stress improving sleep and things like that when there is no actual uh, sleep societies in the world clinical societies that study sleep and prepare guidelines for uh, sleep disorders in the world have never ever mention ashwagandha in their guidelines by the way but people do take ashwagandha for sleep and all that so we have a lot of patients who developed ashwagandha related liver injury and this is a multi center project uh, we are preparing that study now and i think it's going to be a very important study a lot of people a lot of myths will be busted with that particular study because we are going deep into uh, systematic reviews on uh, ashwagandha and its impact on human health and disease and also discussing how ashwagandha is more harmful than beneficial Hmm. This is gonna be quite a ride. So uh, I have three small, small topics left before we we wind up. Uh, one is okay. B52, another is alcohol, third is coffee. So I would <laughs> let you choose the order. Yeah, I mean I'll I'll, I'll go with uh, coffee first because it's my okay. favorite. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So um, the uh, I mean this is this is something that gets a lot of interaction or engagement on Twitter. when when i talk about that is coffee so um, and i i do to, to uh, i mean open disclosure i don't own any stocks uh, in any coffee <laughs> companies and i have no i don't i don't own a coffee company also so yeah. uh, basically uh, it, uh, if when you look by look at the diet aspect or nutritional aspect i think coffee is one of the most highly studied uh, dietary uh, component with regards to human health and disease management um and from specific liver point per se i think there are a lot of very good quality observational data systematic reviews of those observational data a lot of prospectively uh, performed observational trials on large patients over decades systematic reviews and meta analysis of those trials and something known as umbrella review so umbrella review is basically whole analysis or whole study of large systematic reviews and meta analysis which is like topmost level of 
data that we can gather from a particular intervention on a particular intervention so such studies have shown that uh, black coffee caffeinated or decaffeinated without sugar up to 3 cups a day minimum you need 3 cups is very helpful and beneficial for improving liver related uh, aspects for example it reduces the risk of somebody developing cirrhosis it reduces the chances of somebody with chronic liver disease developing liver cancer it reduces the chances of somebody with fatty liver progressing to a severe form of fatty liver it reduces liver fat content it helps improve um, clinical outcomes in patients with cirrhosis for example complications related to cirrhosis if patient is on if the person is on more than 3 cups of black coffee without sugar and without milk uh, per day for over uh, many weeks to many months that actually has a positive impact so these are all well well performed and well analyzed uh, studies uh, even though we don't have data on randomized control of coffee with tea and all that because it's not easy uh -huh. to do that i mean it's not easy to perform a nutrition study uh, and follow these patients up for a long time because we'll have a lot of uh, uh, dropouts in such a study and a lot of other confounding factors also can come in depending on the brand of coffee or a type of coffee that somebody prefers so it's so many things to control for which is not easy for us to perform as a randomized trial so we are left with good prospectively done observations and uh, we have good data that shows that coffee is very beneficial for all of this especially with regards to liver health i want to also make a point here that there is a there is a misinformation that is floating around in social media <clears throat> i recently tackled that also where somebody said that uh, coffee reverses uh, damage to the liver brought on by alcohol this is wrong which which implies that if you if you are drinking alcohol and you want to protect your liver drink coffee along with it this is completely wrong coffee only prevents or reduces the risk of progression of cirrhosis and it's not just alcohol it's for all etiologies or all, all causes for example viral causes of cirrhosis non alcoholic fatty liver alcoholic fatty liver disease all of this together so coffee does not reduce or prevents damage due to alcohol the only thing that can prevent damage due to alcohol is to go for abstinence if you don't drink alcohol you can prevent damage from alcohol that is it and there is nothing above and beyond it which brings us to the second topic alcohol so uh, this is i think something that i have been talking about very frequently so uh, i mean to 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 be very open about it i used to drink alcohol I mean, I used to drink like a fish when I was in college. I used to enjoy my alcohol for a very long time. And probably the last many, many years, I think about three or four years, I have stopped consuming at all. I uh, consume uh, alcohol-free wine and alcohol-free beer, which is like that. It tastes like that, but absolutely no alcohol in it. Um, I uh, consume kombucha, which has probably very mild kombucha. levels of alcohol, less than... Yeah, kombucha, which is like yeah. less than 1% of alcohol. There is sugar content. The sugar content is high there. Yeah, so there is, I mean, there are different uh, methods of preparing it where they actually prepare uh, lesser sugar forms of kombucha. I mean, this is maybe once in a month or so I take it. I mean, just when I go out with friends. But I that, that I mean, that, that those are my beverage uh, options I, I was specifying. And especially my uh, go-to beverage is actually a coffee. So alcohol has a huge... Uh, impact on what uh, I see in a day-to-day -day basis because I see a, a spectrum of alcohol that many people don't see. Uh, even other doctors don't see. Uh, I, I think psychiatrists do see a large spectrum of alcohol use disorders and uh, you know people who are in direction. But I see another aspect where uh, I write about, um, on an average, three to four death summaries per week because of people dying of alcohol. That's a huge number. So when I look at it per month, I, I write about 12 to 14 death summaries of people who have died because of alcohol. And most of these patients, people are um, between the ages of 35 and 45. Very productive age and they're dying of alcohol use. And it's very disheartening because when somebody says that, uh, you know, occasional alcohol use is fine. Somebody will ask me, uh, I'm, can I take one drink a year or one drink a month? You know, it, it sounds silly, but the problem is that there is no amount of alcohol that is safe. 
single exposure to alcohol in a woman single exposure i'm not talking about continued use just a single exposure to alcohol in a woman drastically increases the chances of developing breast cancer so that's 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 what alcohol is a single exposure just like uh, lead so who says that there is no safe level of lead so the heavy metal lead exposure impacts human health negatively with a single exposure same way who has also said that there is no safe level of alcohol so there is nothing like i am drinking three uh, drinks of wine a week and i am expecting things to improve in me or get better in me that is great expectations i mean it's wishful thinking it doesn't happen because no amount of alcohol is actually safe so i always advise people to uh, abstain from alcohol look at other options other than alcohol where you can be, where you can be part of a social gathering where there is no alcohol you can go for a lot of alcohol free options with the taste of alcohol i mean for example alcohol free beers where they have there are uh, companies which produce alcohol free beers without any alcohol in it and that tastes like beer only it's it's pretty good and uh, then uh, the second aspect is i if somebody wants to drink it is their personal choice so i can't impose anything because it is already mentioned on the alcohol bottle that drinking alcohol is injurious to your health so it's an that yeah. is an informed yeah it's it's an informed decision i mean we are all adults so if somebody wants to drink alcohol it's an informed decision it is not it is not as per an advice because as per advice consuming alcohol uh, is not recommended right because i have been seeing people young people dying of alcohol use and they all started with occasional alcohol they moved on to moderate alcohol then they went into severe alcohol use and they ultimately became alcohol use disorder people and uh, people with alcohol use disorder and uh, died because of organ failures so this aspect of alcohol is uh, love and hate for me uh, uh, love because i i love to discuss about it uh try to change people the way they approach alcohol and consume alcohol i hate because the how much how much have i try to convince or uh, educate people about it i still see alcohol as the biggest cause of death among my patients so this is this is the biggest problem that i face with alcohol got it and and uh, if i have to ask you what does uh, in in very simple terms what does alcohol starts to do with your liver so the the whole metabolism so when you take alcohol the liver is the organ that has that is a concerned organ that takes it out of the body so what happen in simple terms what happens is liver will metabolize alcohol into acetaldehyde through various enzymatic processes and then it com- it it go- comes out of the liver and goes out in the urine these uh, metabolized forms some of them uh, gets absorbed for example uh, if you give the liver the amount of alcohol that it can metabolize and completely drive out you will not have much effects on the body but when you consume lot of alcohol or keep consuming lot of alcohol uh, the liver will reach a limiting point where it cannot completely drive out the harmful metabolites that it forms in the body for example acetaldehyde so that increases in the body and the liver is not able to take it out and that gets absorbed and that is what goes to your brain and affects all other parts of the body that is what causes all the harm in, including injury to the liver so you are overwhelming that organ or stretching it stretching its limits to uh, uh, in protecting you for example liver is an organ which has great patience you throw things at it it will recover by itself because it is a highly regenerating organ there is no organ in the body that does that it's a very forgiving organ but even a forgiving organ has its limits you know you you people can't keep forgiving somebody for the same mistakes over and over again so at some point uh, there will be a straw that breaks the camel's back same with the liver so when you overwhelm that organ with excessive consumption of alcohol uh, at some point it is going to get injured and that leads to uh, liver uh, chronic liver disease liver failure and even development of cancers it's not just the liver alcohol affects every part of the body from head to toe So you can yeah. have pancreatic cancer yeah. you can have pancreatitis you can have brain disorder so i had a patient i mean i think people should see this or people should know about it where uh, what alcohol can do to you he has a pristine liver like he has been drinking for a very long time his liver functions are fine this just alcohol fatty liver but no cirrhosis but he is bedridden why because he has developed a complication known as korsakoff psychosis whereby um, 
the use of alcohol over prolonged periods can affect the brain and slowly reduce your brain functions to an extent that you can't realize between what's real and what is unreal you can't you can't differentiate you can't even differentiate between who's your family and who's not you will hallucinate you will go into episodes of delirium you will go into episodes of lucid intervals where sometimes you will know what is happening and suddenly the next moment you don't know what is happening and that person is on the bed for months on with this just imagine that torture it's like a personal hell and it is only because he was consuming alcohol so it is not because it's not just uh, the liver but alcohol can do a lot of other things to your body and some of them are torturous for example korsakov psychosis and that patient uh, recently died because he was uh, he had this psychotic behavior where he could not take care of himself and he was on tube feeding and at one point they had to remove the tube and uh, uh, he he was not letting them put the tube back he had severe malnutrition he aspirated his own saliva which he could not swallow because he was so weak and that caused a lung pneumonia a lung infection pneumonia and ultimately he died and that was that's not a I mean, I mean, there should be some dignity in death also, and there is no dignity in death caused due to alcohol because it's really, it's really torturous to see patients go through that kind of death. So I think people should realize that when you know that alcohol is a socially accepted poison, uh, it is also a socially accepted poison that you can have a choice not to have. So you can, you can, you can. It's your choice. so it's it's an avoidable health burden or avoidable disease burden that that you can actually uh, take from an informed choice point of view the last part is live 52 we just had a, a short reel out on instagram i collabed with another uh, nutrition uh, influencer it's very interesting because uh, it's one of the hottest selling products uh, in india okay, when it comes yeah, to yeah yeah, yeah it, i mean it's one of the hottest selling products it's simple i mean you don't have to look at anything scientific in it. i mean forget the science part of it but just look at the claims part of it in lif 52 is claimed to uh, be beneficial for treating infectious hepatitis that's what they call it as infectious hepatitis so infectious hepatitis can be a lot of things right it can be hepatitis due to dengue fever dengue can affect the liver also so you can have dengue hepatitis dengue fever malaria can affect the liver so that's infectious hepatitis hepatitis a is there directly virus causing hepatitis hepatitis a hepatitis b hepatitis e now you look at all these infections they affect the liver in so many different ways it's not the dengue hepatitis is not the same as uh, hepatitis b hepatitis uh, uh, the hepatitis a hepatitis is not the same as malaria affecting hepatitis so how can a single product fight all of this so there is a simple saying that if you think uh, a simple a single product is been is been marketed as useful for multiple conditions all of them which are totally different from each other the truth is that it works for none of them none right? of them so that is what it is none of them so it's it's like saying that you know i have i have you know it's it's the it's like the ivermectin story for covid so ivermectin was like hot prescription for prevention of covid at some point and so many studies wasting resources were done initially to prove that ivermectin was effective ultimately the best quality study showed that ivermectin is not useful for covid so ivermectin is actually an anti parasite it's a good dewormer in humans and even in horses veterinarians use it in high doses to deworm horses so thinking that is going to fight covid is wishful thinking and we have, we have we know that it doesn't work that way same way ivermectin is an anti parasite it will remain an anti parasite so if lif 52 is going to take care of infectious hepatitis we need to have proof that it takes care of all these types of infectious hepatitis and not just blanket infectious hepatitis now forget infectious hepatitis it has been prescribed as a detox for animals for dogs and cats to improve appetite in animals so how can some something that is already been marketed as uh, a beneficial agent for infectious disease be useful as a beneficial agent as an appetite enhancer and as a detox and as something that can prevent alcohol liver injury and that can prevent or reverse cirrhosis impossible and look at all the studies they are all done by the same company most of the studies are funded by himalaya themselves 
even the meta analysis which is published in a dubious journal which is upon only himalayas website and no other, or no other place is funded by is done by employees of himalaya and not by any independent scientific groups complete absolute hogwash smoke and mirrors kind of uh, marketing and anybody who has some uh, logical sense some rationality will understand that this is a product of beautiful marketing and nothing to do with actual science behind it so whoever is taking himalaya i am very sorry to say that these people have been beautifully deceiving you very good deceptive tactics but i should give give a double thumbs up to the way they have marketed that product because even doctors have fell prey for it so many modern medicine doctors prescribe himalaya for jaundice and all that first thing is that jaundice is not a disease it is a feature of a disease somebody can have jaundice because of liver disease somebody can have jaundice because of a non liver problem also jaundice can come from the blood also because of hemolytic anemias and all people can develop jaundice it nothing to do with the liver so when you are saying that himalaya can cure jaundice that itself is a wrong thing because jaundice is a symptom and not a disease so such simple things people can identify if they are uh, health literate and they can stay away from such mis misinformation that can harm them because many studies have shown and the large quality studies have shown that himalaya leaf 52 product can actually harm the liver and cause liver failure so this part this was done decades before and people still don't know about it even now that is the craziest part it's already there and nobody talks about it and we are now preparing a large series of patients where himalaya leaf 52 was used to treat their liver disease or for other things and they have developed severe liver injury and liver failure and that publication is under under preparation and i hope that will come out in the, within the next 6 months or so after peer review it will be published in a good journal so we are striving to do that so this is all about himalaya that i want to say i mean leaf 52 about uh, i want to say so when i say about leaf 52 people ask me about their other products right septilin and uh, uh, something to do with kidney stone i forgot the cystone <clears throat> other products of himalaya everything is the same it's just marketing there is, there is nothing scientific to substantiate any claims that they make on these products and i think people should be well informed about this so that they can stay away and not harm themselves uh our rabbi philip this was absolutely a wonderful chat you were phenomenal and thank you for uh you know running this fight and we are with you on this one and all best wishes and uh, more power to you and your work uh, it was great 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 having you adi on the show thank you so much i mean uh, this was a very long conversation but i did not feel uh, that way because it was all uh, such important topics that we spoke on uh, casually but effectively and i enjoyed this conversation thank you again for having me on this podcast okay let's stop